Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Art thou ready to laugh? Hear ye. Hear ye. I don't hear thee. Hear ye. Hear ye. Hear ye. Hear ye. Just. Now, everyone, please remember to honor the two cider minimum. As a reminder, we no longer accept hay pennies or the king's pound. Barters and dowries welcome. For those of you with smallpox, please aim for the elderly. And now, without further ado, please welcome Goody Greg and his pontificating parrot, Percival. Thank ye. Thank ye graciously. Look kindly upon the crowd, Percival. Say hello to him. Hello. Witch! Now, now, Percival's merely a trickster. Be nice to him, Percival. Why don't you tell him about yourself? Hello! Ugh, monster! Again, he's not a monster. He's just a bird with an incredible gift of eloquent speech. Now, go ahead, Percival. Recite your favorite work from Milton for them. Oh, Milton! Hello! Kill him! Kill the feather devil! No, 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 please don't hurt, Percival. We meant you! They're not feathers. This is plumage. Witch talk. Design a witch talk. Uh, you got it all wrong. This is merely a novelty act between a man and his bird. We're both classically trained thespians of the Royal Theater. Go ahead, Percival. Tell them what you got your major in. Hello! He thinks he's better than me. I had an impacted major. What was I supposed to do? Only a witch can graduate in this economy. The bird's a witch. Kill the bird. Throw him off a building. If he flies, he's a witch. Burn him at the stake. If he roasts, he's a witch. And we eat him. No, don't hurt Percival. I want nuggets. I want breasts. <gasps> Father Jacoby. Uh, I repent. I call drumstick. No, you can't hurt Percival. Percival, speak to him about the perils of mob mentality. Hello? How can he know so much about the mob mentality? Witch. No, no, you... You were all right. It is I, Goody Greg, who is the warlock. The warlock of Whitechapel. You mean witch. I identify as a warlock. Oh, what outhouse is he using? Spare Percival, he's done no harm. He's a creature of God and an eloquent speaker, aren't you, Percival? Hello! Wise as ever. Percival, fear not. I will face the fire for you. I love you, and I know you feel the same. Tell me one last time that you love me. I... I... I love you too. I once was the bird who said hello, but now for something you all should know. I am the void, the dark lord of all. I was responsible for Goody Greg's fall. All your religions and beliefs I defy. At first I said hello, I now say goodbye. Happy Halloween, I'm Satan. <laughs> Hello! I didn't expect that. It's a kiss. Warm, cuddly feelings now. <laughs> it's Valentine's Day. I forgot. Oh, <gasps> the spookiest time of year. <laughs> Haunted by the ghosts of our past. Haunted by the ghost of loneliness. <laughs> Haunted by the loneliness. I'm so sad. Hold Dude, me. Pardon Either. my French, but <laughs> this is going to be real corker. <laughs> That's French, all right. Nice to see you again, friend. Welcome. Take a seat. Oh, you probably are driving right now. I hope you're sitting. Get off your hoverboard and listen. <laughs> I know everyone likes those standing cars nowadays. It's better for your... It's better for your back if you're standing while driving. I say that. <laughs> I read a I read a BuzzFeed article about it. <laughs> Happy October, Daniel. Happy October to you. It's the month of uh, black cats, falling leaves. Cobwebs. Cobwebs everywhere. It's time for spring cleaning. <laughs> Grab the broom. <laughs> Grab the broom from that witch. You gotta clean up the cobwebs. <laughs> you gotta clean up the house. Clean out the oven. We gotta put Hansel and Gretel in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, hello, Greg. Hey, Daniel, how are you? Nice to see you again. We've had a good month, haven't we? Yeah, have we? <laughs> yeah, no, we've we've got a lot of new listeners, a lot of new listens. People are noticing us. We're liking it. Mr. Podcast DeMille, we're ready for our close-up. <laughs> He's not coming. He retired a long time ago. <laughs> Just like Sunset Boulevard, he's not coming. <laughs> Just like Sunset Boulevard, the police are outside. <laughs> and there's a dead man in the pool. <laughs> yeah, this is episode 34. 34. Of LA Meekly, the podcast. God. What an age. I know. What I an even, age to be living in. It must be so depressed to be 34. But you know what? It's going to trudge on because it has to. Because that's all we know how to do. <laughs> glug, glug. There's no actual water bottle here. He's just making... This is his mime class. He wants to practice. Glug. Oh, I forgot. I'm not supposed to. <laughs> glug. Oh, I did it again. I did it again. As usual, it's Halloween. <laughs> As usual. God, I wish. Here we go again. <laughs> Halloween. Every year's the same, basically. Uh, I mean, we just do the... We're still keeping up with that. I mean... Time is a flat circle. 
Time is a flat pumpkin. Yeah. And we're all seeds that I scoop out of it and think I'm going to eat every year. I don't. You kidding me? I never do. It's covered in goop. It's covered in, in <laughs> pumpkin placenta. I soak it in water to get the placenta off, and then it just turns into moldy mold. <laughs> Thank that's you been, for sharing. That, that's your, been Daniel's Halloween haunted <laughs> tips. <laughs> your Rachel Ray tips of making trash. How can I just ruin a bowl that's in my kitchen and not ever want to use it again? How can I stain my sink to be like beige? <laughs> so this month we planned on talking about witches. So not Ooh. necessarily witches. Oh, 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 oh. witches. <laughs> witches. <laughs> witches. <laughs> uh, we'll stop. We don't know how. As you know, we don't do our really scary episode in October. We're just doing things that are Halloween themed. Yes. Things that'll get you in the mood for this uh, dastardly season. Mm-hmm. We'll save that stuff for Christmas. <laughs> we'll save the gory stuff for Christmas. <laughs> this episode, we're going to be talking about different little witchy things around Los Angeles. Ooh, Greg, stop it. Okay, episode over. Good night. <laughs> Leave us a review. Bye. <laughs> in this, the 34th episode of the 34th year of the 34th. <gasps> the number of the beast. <laughs> three, four. <laughs> three, four. <laughs> he can't afford that many numbers anymore. Why a three, four, five? I don't know. <laughs> because six, six, six. <gasps> we gotta go. Oh, no. <laughs> we shouldn't have killed that chicken on the way over here. So yeah, we're going to be talking about a few uh, witchy residents, mm-hmm. a few witchy celebrities, mm-hmm. and a witchy place. Yeah. We're talking about witch, witch. This episode sponsored by Witch Witch, and also Witch Way LA, a different podcast, and also uh, just sandwiches in general. Yeah, in general, subs, deli sandwiches, you know, torpedoes. <clears throat> All right, get emotional when I bring up. I'm just dancing just around the world, hoagie. Get us started. Yeah, so let's get right into it with our first entry into this spookiest of episodes. If you are a child, I'm going to be talking about a witch. No. Yeah. On a broomstick? Big nose? Hat? Mole on her nose? She goes, hey, 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 Yeah, that's her. You caught her? We got her, boys. You can all let your fat children go play in the woods again. <laughs> We're safe. They're just fodder for regular child molesters. <laughs> Don't worry. They won't get eaten. Well, they might get eaten. Start. <laughs> In a town where, for some reason, we can't even become the official podcast of Los Angeles, once upon a time, the city had an official witch really? of Los Angeles, and her name was Louise Hubner. <laughs> Are those bats? Yeah. Those are bats that forgot how to use sonar. That sounds like someone taking a buckshot trying to hit a bat. It's bat hunting season. Uh, And the the rifleman's also blind. Go ahead. (laughs) This mysterious woman was born in 1931, as she puts it, as a sixth generation witch and a third generation astrologer. But as some put it, a first generation phony baloney. There isn't much out there about Hubner's childhood, other than that at age two, she started doing psychic readings. And at age nine, she started a newspaper filled with gossip about her neighbors that she gathered from spying on all of them <laughs> and at age 10 she started doing palm readings at children's carnivals sounds like grifter like a common grifter you're just asking for a hex <laughs> whether or not this was going on in la or whatever town something wicked this way comes took place in i don't know but by the time she was a little older she was supernaturally right here in los angeles mm-hmm. the city of angels oh no <gasps> they st- couldn't stand for that <laughs> not in this city she loves me she not- protects me against witches <laughs> The city, she's unholy. The city, I must stuff garlic down her throat. In 1965, she began a four-year run as the resident mystic on the KLAC radio station, which now is the AM570 radio home of the Doyers. Doyers. On this, she did psychic readings over the air and once every two hours, totaling 12 times a day, they aired taped segments of hers giving out that day's astrology readings. Mm -hmm. So she really started out on the radio as a sort of high-profile strip mall psychic. That She's like uh, Mystic Frasier. (laughs) <laughs> which is my, my fav- favorite rom-com. romantic home. Yeah, She was so present. She was just everywhere all the time. So she became a sort of local celebrity and started being a guest on a lot of shows on KTTV, which is now Channel 11. She'd show up on a lot of talk shows dressed in all black and with her pet beetle, Sandoz. <laughs> pet uh, beetle? Pet beetle. You didn't have one? No, nah, I didn't have one. I wasn't uh, affluent or mystic enough. You didn't buy into Beetlemania, the second? <laughs> the very literal wave of Beetlemania? <laughs> it was also a real wave. <laughs> Wash all the Beatles away. Being on TV lent her a little bit of prestige and soon she was doing psychic readings for elected officials and celebrities all over the city. She claimed that she predicted not only JFK's assassination but also RFK's assassination. Wow. Listen to the warm California gun or you will be assassinated. <laughs> and she also claimed she predicted Johnson's decision to not run for re-election. Listen to March Madness. Do uh, right. you can read the sign. She also claims to have predicted the Watts riot but who didn't? We all saw that. We were all psychics for a week. Something
something bad's going to happen. Why do the Beatles keep running away? <laughs> Ringo, Ringo, why don't you want to go to South Central? Ringo, George Sutcliffe, where are you going? <laughs> Sometimes she was even called in to help solve crimes. Really? Yeah. When they ran out of a detective was taking a lunch yeah. break. They, <laughs> when they couldn't get a dog to try to solve the crime, they called her in <laughs> instead. The dog's taking a nap. <laughs> we can't wake him up. He's too cute sleeping. <laughs> we couldn't bear to do it. Call the witch. But more so than just a radio era Miss Cleo, Hubner was more of a sex-driven self-help man- mantra, mantra, mantra? Is it mantra or mantra? Mantra. Hmm. A Mothra guru <laughs> of 60s and 70s LA, of which there were many of these people around. She was a big proponent of orgies, and most of her workings were sex-related. Okay. If you heard a thud after I said that, excuse me, but I certainly burst my britches reading that sentence. (laughs) She was also very involved in the community. She used her witching powers of organization to help plan several city events such as a birthday party for LA that lasted 18 hours with Coca-Cola giving them free soda. Wow. The Butcher's Union gave them free hot dogs and Van de Camp's gave them a keg big enough to feed 10,000 people. Oh my god. (laughs) And the Beatles got to it. (laughs) They left it out too long. It was Beatlemania on that keg. She gave eight months of her own volunteer time to plan all of this just like eight months of her life just wow. for free doing this now she had a good reputation with the city even though she was a self-proclaimed witch that was a business card she had yeah, yeah. witch i'm a witch i'm a lover i'm a child i'm a lover again because she was so into sex <laughs> i love many at once <laughs> even being a witch that was actually more of an appeal for the city six months after this spoiled child birthday party for the city of los angeles the la department of parks and recreation decided they could take advantage and asked her to help plan a series of concerts they had coming up at the hollywood bowl okay. it was was for 12 summer concerts over 12 Sunday afternoons at the Hollywood Bowl, masterfully named 12 Summer Sunday Concerts at the Hollywood Bowl. Jesus Christ. A very literal time in our country. <laughs> the first concert in the lineup was called Folklore Day. And the idea of that was very appealing to Hubner. And she came up with a marketing gimmick that for the show, she would be made the official witch of Los Angeles County and would cast a spell on the entire audience in attendance. Don't give her a reason or the power. Yeah, well, the city apparently has never read a single fairy tale and they <laughs> thought this is a great idea. Can she get rid of our rats too? <laughs> Here's all the children. Do you need them for something? (laughs) There's a cave over there. (laughs) What do you want to do? So on June 21st, 1968, at a special ceremony at the Hollywood Bowl, she was made cultural chairman of the 14th district by Councilman Arthur Snyder and also presented with a certificate officially by city law anointing her the official witch of Los Angeles County. What's what's happening? (laughs) She signed it in virgin blood. (laughs) A puff of black smoke went up. It was weird. All these church burnings were that day too. I don't understand. (laughs) And that's how the council... Capitol Records building was fun. Uh-huh. She turned the mayor into it because he looked at her wrong. So this document, it had the county seal on it and was signed by the chairman of the board of county supervisors, Ernest Debs. This made LA the only city in the world to have had an official witch. It just has? Ever. Like, no one has had, who would have an official witch? May- maybe like a bad town in like 1840. <laughs> yeah, Los Angeles. <laughs> the certificate read, this certifies that Louise Hubner has been designated as the official witch of Los Angeles County by virtue of her super natural powers and is officially assigned to reign over folk day at the hollywood bowl on july 21st 1968 at which time she may be depended upon (laughs) according to which time you're ready (laughs) at which time she may be depended upon to cast a spell over all of los angeles county wow that was like signed by somebody yeah it was signed by very official people and then she cackled turned the councilman into a toad and ate a baby (laughs) and then it came time for the actual spell she was depended upon to cast what she decided to do is called a spell cast it was the first podcast all about witchy witchy things a spell cast is when a bunch of witches come together to cast a huge spell over a large amount of people and this was okay yeah what's wrong it's the 60s (laughs) we're looking for like a new thing you know like a new thing like possession (laughs) like Uh, mass possession i don't want to be possessed by anyone except satan to help her in this giant spell hubner got a coven of witches to pool their powers she also got laurie steakhouse to donate the salt and garlic they needed the worst witch of them all (laughs) and the la zoo loaned a bunch of iguanas to put on stage for atmosphere but apparently the iguanas were so ugly they sent them back to the zoo but it was so hot that one of them died on the way back i feel like always i'm an iguana at the hollywood
I would bowl. Like, no, I thought this send was a good idea, back. but they're so ugly. Send me a handsome iguana. <laughs> One who has confidence. A lizard that you could take to prom. You know what? We just get us a dog. The stage was all set, but what was the spell going to be? Hubner being Huberter, she decided it would be a fertility spell to increase in Cleese. John Cleese. <gasps> He's a witch. Witch. <laughs> He was in that Harry Potter movie. It must be true. A fertility spell to increase and sustain the sexual vitality of Los Angeles. Again, this was all just really clever marketing because as we know, sex spell sells. So then came the show. 11,000 people showed up. Everyone was given some chalk, red candles, and garlic. Yeah, wow. Yeah, a red candle. <laughs> Believe it. Are there photos of this? No, you can't capture a witch on film. Nah, just floating candles everywhere. This is the haunted mansion. <laughs> she gave Chairman Debs, the guy who had signed her certificate, she gave him a golden horn to personally ensure his own sexual virility. <laughs> California in the 60s, they were not kidding. No, everything was just golden idols and orgies. <laughs> and your aura. Orgies. Aura. <laughs> so the witches in the crowd, they all chanted, light the flame, bright the fire, red is the color of desire. And the spell was cast. This was was the first time in the history of witchcraft that such a big spell covering such a large area and involving so many people to cast was ever done. Like, this is the biggest spell this ever cast. <laughs> Side note, when the spell was cast, there were only 78 cities in LA County. There are now 88. So, if anyone wants to do some population tests to see if the new 10 are less fertile, we give you permission to knock yourselves out. <laughs> uh, and up. This stunt sent the Hubner brand even higher into the witchosphere. In 1969, she released both a book called Power Power Through Witchcraft, mm -hmm. and a spoken word album called Seduction Through Witchcraft, which was released by Warner Music and was sampled in some David Bowie bootleg recordings. <laughs> the album was also produced by B.B. and Louise Barron, who were early electronic music makers who had done the score for the movie Forbidden Planet, which was the first entirely electronic film score ever. In 1970, she was invited to Salem, Massachusetts, in an effort by the mayor to ask forgiveness for what happened to witches Don't. in that town in if colonial went, time. If she went, she's a dummy. Because that's an ambush. Just get up there. Stand on this. We got you a new podium. It's so dark. Someone light the way. <laughs> you know those standing cars people like? <laughs> Go stand on that standing podium. So she went there and she was presented with a broom engraved with the words, may your ride be long and enjoyable. I thought it, the 60s was a turbulent time where they didn't mess around. This was all done unironically. <laughs> this is the struggle no one talks about. Where's their Martin Luther King? They burned her <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> Martin Luther Sorcerer. Stop. Also in 1970, she released a new book called Never Strike a Happy Medium. She loved <laughs> It. it was released on Witch Time. She was also on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. In all, she ended up having written two books, released one album, and was part of a second album called Occult Explosion, wrote several mini books for the Hallmark Company, and she was in around 350 magazine and newspaper articles Whoa. and on over 300 TV shows, movies, and documentary. This was all according to her, at least. <laughs> but she was still a concubine of Satan, so not everything went quite her way. With her rising star inside of a circle came some pushback from the City of Angels. Obviously, I was waiting for that. When will they fight back? <laughs> when will good triumph? Um, when will I stop being so horny? <laughs> I mean, every day and night. When will this curse be lifted? <laughs> I mean, I can only give so much. <laughs> Obviously, Hubner was good at marketing. So when it came time for her to release her books and album, how could she not use her title as the official witch yeah. of Los Angeles to help boost sales? Yeah. The problem was her books and album were... Of, of a very sexual nature. Yes, they were. And the city didn't want their name attached to anything like that. So the guy who had given her that title, Chairman Deb, said that the title was meant to be for only that one day that she was to cast the spell at the bowl and told her to stop. But nobody stops a witch. No. Hubiner said that she worked for months for free to help plan not just the Hollywood Bowl stuff, but other city events. And the only compensation she got for it was that certificate naming her the Supreme Witch. So why not just let her use it to try to make some money for yeah. herself? Debs insisted that surely you understand that this scroll was purely ceremonial and for publicity for that performance at the Hollywood Bowl and you have to stop. Oh Hubner did not take it so lightly and insisted on keeping the title and that it was legally binding. By which law? <laughs> Witchigation. <laughs> the people versus um, I can't even think of a who, who's a famous witch? There's no famous witches. Stevie Nicks. <laughs> so the city hit her with a cease and desist order but she responded that she never claimed to have been employed by the county just that she was the official witch of the county and that if Here's her quote. If Supervisor Debs persists in asking the Department of Parks and Recreation to unload me, that will only create bad feelings in me, and I will be forced through an act of pride to take back the Los Angeles County spell for increased sexual vitality. She went even further to say that if Debs wanted her title back, she wants back the magical golden horn that was meant to ensure his romantic vitality. In the end, they let her keep the title. They want to make it seem like, oh, I'm going to put my, vir yeah. my virility. Yeah. It seems like they let her keep the title because revoking it would have opened up a whole can 
can of worms on all the other official titles the city had given out over the previous 200 years. Yeah, like, okay. oh, you're the official gold miner. Like, yeah. But the industrious witch she was, Hubner held a press conference for international media outlets to tell them this story, and in doing so, her name got spread all over the world. Wow, played. Marketing maven. Mm. However, this was around the same general time as the Manson murders, so the story, <laughs> <laughs> the story quickly got brushed aside into oblivion because newspapers and magazines didn't want to run a story sympathetic to a witch in the middle of Helter Skelter piggy murders. Especially like the Manson family, which was just about free sex. And here's like, oh, everyone should be virile. Like, no, <laughs> no, not right now. Stop it. <laughs> not at this time. Too much sex. She also faced some blowback from Wiccans because they were embarrassed by Hubner because she wasn't Wiccan. She was a witch. But people still associated her with them and they yeah. felt she was perpetuating negative stereotypes of witches. Don't you want negative stereotypes if you're a witch? I'm sorry. No, they, they, I mean, Wiccans are just like cunning, I, I wi- understand. cunning women or whatever the term for a good witch is. <laughs> what is it? Glinda's. But still, she kept on going. She did lectures at colleges. She was the founder of several societies, such as the Society of Professional Astrologers, Mount Washington Poets and Artists Backyard Conservancy, and started doing miracle circles, which involved gathering a large group of people to harness their psychic powers to make a miracle happen. She also started Magic Circle International, which counted 4,000 witches all across the country as members, making it the largest coven in the United States. In 1977, the Angels, of all teams, of course, the baseball team, that is, they were in a slump and supposedly cursed so they called in Hubner who gave magic circle medals to the players their general manager and their owner Gene Autry the team <laughs> what wow. do I do with this Los Angeles is an odd place <laughs> Gene Autry is going to a witch to get his baseball team to win games that sums somebody, up Los Angeles somebody needs to go make Fatty Arbuckle more horny so he can win some baseball games somebody needs to go stop Griffith J. Griffith from shooting his wife to appease the Pope because we need to get more oil Does that all make sense? (laughs) So after she gave him these medals, the team then won six games in a row, but then she revoked the spell because she said the players were being insulting and quote, I felt I shouldn't have used the energy of the magic circle because the angels were not sincere and honest, (laughs) which sounds like Satan's, like that was the last thing Satan said before he left heaven. (laughs) This is stupid. You guys are (laughs) messing with me. What are you going to do, fall down? (laughs) Whoa! Whoa. I fell too far. (laughs) I, I had a joke here also, which sounds like either a line from a Charlie Brown special or something every witch in history has said. (laughs) Hubner also had a family. She had a husband and a twin boy and a girl and a third son and towards the end of her day she was running an antique shop called Mini Mall Antiques and Collectibles in Pasadena. We should talk about her husband just a little bit because behind every great witch there is an equally greater warlock. (laughs) Equally greater, equally great warlock. Yes equality. Her husband's name was Mentor Hubner, which uh, confused me to no end to realize that was a person's name. Like I thought that was a title. I thought that was like, that's what they call Louise Hubner, Mentor Hubner. So her husband, Mentor Hubner, he was a very accomplished artist and designer who seems to have been responsible for most things we like on this podcast. Really? He he worked on a lot of movies doing production design and storyboards, many times uncredited. Some of the movies he had a major influence on? Dune. Planet of the Apes, Blade Runner, Forbidden Planet, The Thing, The Land of the Lost TV Show, The 1976 King Kong, Fiddler on the Roof, The Longest Day, The Time Machine, North by Northwest, Ben-Hur, Quo Vadis, and The Addams Family. Wow, really? Yeah. He also did 51 man shows and designed 10 theme parks, including France and Japan's Disneyland. He also taught at Chouinard's Art School for 20 years. Really? Luis became Mentor's manager in 1980, but when he died on March 19th, 2001, she spent much of her time time trying to promote and preserve his legacy until she herself died in 2014 uh-huh. or did she she did I dug her up she's, <laughs> she's in there <laughs> she's in a cauldron but she mm. is dead Boy, that's not a memory I will be able to forget <laughs> but uh, you're I, welcome listeners she's in there I'm cursed by the memory of that now <laughs> oh very interesting yeah that's our first little witch of the evening now I know you're gonna say Greg these aren't witches you're right they're witchy but we're gonna talk about a couple vamps wait let me vamp a little bit keep going hello yes mommy good dear okay go on how can you age evil or lust how can you age shadow or fog you can't you can 
Age of Fog Machine. <laughs> the first horror host, or more appropriate, hostess, is created in Los Angeles, and her name is Vampira in the early 50s. Los Angeles is also home to the most famous horror host, Elvira. Wait a minute, when you say the first? I mean, there's the Crypt Keeper in EC Comics. That That's, doesn't count. But like... But he wasn't on TV. No. So she's li- she's the, the first, first horror host. Really? Yeah. Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. Because TV was like four years old. <laughs> and they didn't have a horror host yet? <laughs> I mean, the whole idea basically was all stations had people like... <laughs> We would like present cartoons and stuff like that, but nobody had it for like these B movies and horror movies. Yeah, okay. She was the first one. Huh, interesting. And a woman at that. Hmm. They had those back then. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Vampire was born on December 11th, 1922, as Elizabeth Myla. Here we go. Sarajana, Sarajanami. In Gloucester, Massachusetts. That's a curse. <laughs> Gloucester, Massachusetts, home of cartoonist Tony Millionaire, who mm. was the reason we did our episode, Griffith vs. Getty. Hey, don't give him too much credit. You're right. He's, He's a millionaire. Through her career, she gave multiple interviews stating that she was born in Patsamo, Finland, because she kept pushing the idea that she was related to the famous Finnish Olympic diver Pavo Nermi, who was mentioned in the Grand Olympics episode. Really? He yeah. was? Nermi arrived in Los Angeles for the 32 Olympics, but was disqualified because he was declared a professional athlete and wasn't allowed to compete. And what was funny about that was when I read his name doing the research, I was like, Huh, Nermi, like Vampira. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what Vampira thought too. His name's like my name. As far as I can tell, it's not true. And that's the one thing about Myla, as she would later call herself. She was very standoffish about revealing too much biographical information in interviews. She was very reclusive for many years. She was very private. That's my witch didn't have much yeah. stuff. Maybe they really were witches. Yeah, they don't want to get away. <laughs> Vampira and Louise Hubner. <laughs> oh, my, take, they're having an orgy. Take a seat, ladies. You're very old. <laughs> Both of you. So old. Please, we'll get to you later. <laughs> Her father, Oni... I brought my magical horny horn. <laughs> I can't even be near it because it's so horny. Her father, Oni Surajanami, later shortened to Nermi, or Nermi. Is that Armenian? No, it's Finnish. Siraj Nanami. Is that in Armenia? You know, I don't even know where Finland is, okay? Oh, it's close to Russia. Don't admit that on a podcast. He immigrated from Finland to North America about 1910. There was a surge of Finnish immigrants who came to America between 1850 to 1900, while Finland struggled with the uh, czarist Russia. In 1920, Oni met an American woman, Sophia, and gave birth to two children, one of them being Malia. Hmm. No, Myla, sorry. I always say her name wrong, like it's Obama's daughter. Myla. <laughs> so Obama's daughter is a witch. <laughs> Interesting. She's a vamp. Her father was part of the Temperance Union, the Finnish Temperance Union, who wasn't necessarily anti-alcohol, but they were definitely like a progressive group, which you kind of see in Myla later. They moved around a lot. She spent some childhood in Ashtabula, Ohio, and she struggled particularly, their whole family did during the Depression, obviously. She was a very dreamy and dramatic young woman. She was once quoted by saying by a friend that she never caught the gist of being alive and that (laughs) things outside the womb would never cease to be weird and terrifying. Outside the womb? Womb. Very vampire. Amen, (laughs) vampire. I feel ya. Her teen years were rough. She was alienated and bullied a lot in the story of Oregon when kind of ended up. She landed in Astoria in 1939 and stayed to graduate there in 1940. She took theater and drama classes and found great pride in playing other people. She yeah. said one of the most satisfying moments of her days was when she was dressed as the dragon lady from the Terry and the Pirates comic strip. Nurmi found it quite empowering dressing up like a strong sexual female. Mm. But boy, as soon as 1940 hit, she graduated. She left hobo style. Just got out. She first came to Hollywood as many, many, many other young people did in that day to get in the moving pictures. <laughs> she was also now going by her middle name and a reworking shortened version of her Vampira. last name. Vampira. Vampira. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vampira. She went from Sarajanami to Niami, which her father was going by, to Nermi. Now, Myla Nermi is what she's going by. There doesn't seem to be much about her first time in Los Angeles other than her attempting to become a cheesecake model, which she did accomplish. Mm. But it was just work to pay the bills. She modeled a long cheesecake. It was just work to pay the bills. All this modeling for cheesecake stuff was kind of, it was like pre-Betty Page, Bunny Yeager pinup. So it's just kind of like cutesy smile. You're by a bunch of rocks. It still wasn't as liberating experience. She still hadn't found what she was looking for doing this. Mm, you in, too. in an attempt to get on stage, she joined a troupe that went cross country and ended up on Mae West's Catherine Was Great play. She may or may not have been fired from that, but I can't get a clear word. In 1944, though. May or May West. <laughs> May East, May West. In 1944, she got cast in a theater review of the New York based Dr. Silkini's Spook Show, a macabre spook show, which had elements of a magic show and like universal monster movies. Mm. It's like a live review. It sounds really cool. Dr. Silkini had one of the more popular shows in New York at the time. So apparently there was like a magic show to open it, then a sort of like make a monster sketch or something in the middle that had like horror themes. And then they'd close with another magic show, which sounds like everything I've ever wanted. <laughs> and she got picked up by another one of these spook shows produced by Mike Todd, who would later go on to marry Elizabeth Taylor. Again, unclear what she did, whether she performed in the show or wasn't one of these like atmospheric body art players in the lobby. Just kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Either way, she gets a write up in the Hollywood Reporter, which gets her noticed by old pee in the jar, Howie Hawks. Oh. Howard Hawks, who flew her back Wait. to. 
He puts pee in the jar? I thought Howard Hughes put oh, pee in the jar. Oh, it's Howard Hughes. That's yeah, right. he doesn't put pee in the jar. I get the HH is confused. Yeah, Part of the 4-H put, club, he, I was going to confuse. <laughs> he put good things in the jar. Don't worry about Howard Hawks. Who flew her? He directed Ferris Bueller, right? <laughs> he flew Mila back to Los Angeles in 1945 and signed her to be in one of his films based on the Russian novel Dreadful Hollow, which was supposed to have a screenplay written by old booze hog F. Scotty Fitzgerald. <laughs> but just like most of their projects together, nothing really happened. Howard Hawks' big picture at the time was The Big Sleep, based on the Raymond Chandler novel, and Mila believes that she was plucked because of her resemblance to the film star Lauren Bacall, whom mm-hmm. Hawks also discovered. She does look a little bit like her. But again, not much happened. She was just became like some Hawks standby girl. Contract was signed up. She's just waiting to be activated, but nothing happened. She has an uncredited role in a film called If Winter Comes. Nothing there. So she returned to cheesecake modeling and she posed for pinup artist Alberto Vargas, who was very famous, as well as photographer Man Ray. Again, very famous. Mm. In 1949, she gets married to a former child star and screenwriter Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple. Screenwriter Dean Reznor, who would later write the screenplays for Dirty Harry and Play Misty for Me. Hmm. Yeah. She was voted Miss Ocean Beach of 1952 in Glamorous Models magazine. She had a centerfold magazine full of surfer bunny types. And although, yes, she was beautiful, she didn't quite have the like blonde surfer look that California was known for. Like Milo looked foreign. People have commented on her having like a slight Scandinavian look. I don't Isn't know. that blonde surfer type? That's what I thought too, like bulky. But I don't know. But people would comment. I think maybe because of her like she had high cheekbones and her eyebrows were kind of raised and stuff, <laughs> but I don't even know. But she didn't look, in my opinion, didn't look American. She looks like Finnish. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in my definition of American. <laughs> American, she did not fit in. Like, none of this was the right fit for her. It wasn't the thing that was going to catch. And it's so odd that a small town girl gets, so, like, so close to stardom so fast. Mae West, Howard Hawks, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Alberto Vargas, Man Ray, all these opportunities with famous folk and nothing is quite fitting mm-hmm. right. Amidst all this frustration, confusion in her life, in that September 1951, Cassandra Peterson was born in Manhattan, Kansas. The town's nickname is the Little Apple. <laughs> From what I understand, it's a small college town uh, that... Very Little Apple. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small college town that runs along the Kansas River. It's about two hours away from Kansas City. Her mother owned a costume shop and her father was an insurance sales rep. As a child, she was severely burned when she pulled a pot of boiling water brewing Easter eggs off the stove and and she was doused with it. 35% of her body had to be skin grafted and she was in the hospital for three months because of this. She was bullied through much of her childhood because of it. Some like some sort of common monster. Meanwhile. (laughs) Meanwhile. Meanwhile. She was a monster. (laughs) Meanwhile, back in Los Angeles, a spectacle. The Joker's recruiting men. (laughs) Back in Los Angeles. Cut to City of Angels. Witches. Back to Gotham City. (laughs) Witches everywhere. Fornicating. <laughs> Spectacular thing happens in Los Angeles or everywhere. Television. Oh, I love it. I love, I love it. it. What is it? I, mean, I love, love it. it. I, I've never seen one, but I love it. Now, the pressure on getting into films was alleviated as now there was room for hungry actors to be cast in a TV show or commercial advertisement. Now, it kind of spread the pressure off of films. Now, you can no, go be in a commercial. Go be in Pepsi Cola. Or some... advertise cancer cigarettes. <laughs> well, the 40s were some good post war years. The 50s in America is when the post war boom really gets its peak. The prosperity reigned supreme for some people, and you could just laugh at the Great Depression. Now, the youth of America had spare time and spare money like never before and they had a small rebellion that was building within the youth that opposed the repression brought forth by anti-communist displays of conformity before rock and roll was ready to be served to dorky american boys in small towns <laughs> all you had was beat poets and bebop jazz which great but you also had new neat things like the cartoons of wildly macabre artist charles adams creator of the thin unnamed comic strip the adams family mm-hmm. no, it was never named that mentor in hubner will soon come by and make his work great i don't know if it's great it's it's as good <laughs> his comics were witty and dark playfully mocking the squeaky clean ideals of the 50s the early years of television television the earth the early years had like shows like people had never seen before like the sid caesar show was to them at the time unpredictable mm-hmm. you don't know what sid caesar is gonna do next <laughs> what's it gonna, is he gonna strangle mel brooks again <laughs> with her talents and her screenwriter husband she was hoping to make a splash in the industry and get a movie contract like everybody else was she just had to be patient and jump at the right opportunity and that opportunity came on Halloween night, 1953. She's waiting at the crossroads. <laughs> Robert Johnson's there. She pushes him away and says, Ladies my turn. first. <laughs> blood. Ladies first blood. Yeah. That's my female Rambo reboot. <laughs> It's also about periods. Yeah, subtext. She kills the entire staff of a sheriff's department (laughs) with her period. By the raw power of a woman's period. I am woman, hear me, period. I am woman, hear me, poor. (laughs) Don't know if that can go in. None none of this can. I don't even know if the episode can go in. Myla's character origin stems from a ritzy Hollywood masquerade ball held by choreographer Lester Horton, which was called the Bal Karib Halloween Extravaganza. Lester Horton was a dance director for Tarzan and the Leopard Woman, which starred one of the two Olympians who would play Tarzan. And this one was played by swimmer Johnny Westmuller. The other Tarzan who was Olympian was Buster Crab, who was the one that swam in the I 32 Olympics. Yeah. At the time, her idea for television was to create a show based on Charles Adams' comic strip. Since it was such a delicious... It'll never 
never work. It won't work. Come Who, who's on. Who's going to do it? Who's going to play Gomez? <laughs> How are they going to do the thing or whatever? Samwise Gangi's father? I don't know his name. Gangi. Gangi. What the hell's his name? Uh, Samwise. Gamji. Is it Gamji? Samwise Gamji. His dad plays Gomez. Is it his dad? John Aston. Wait a minute. Samwise Gamji's dad was Gomez Adams? And his mom's Patty Duke. His name's Sean Aston. I can't see that. We'll look it up later. I simply cannot see that. We'll look it up later. Hmm. All right. She wanted to make a Charles Adams. But he's so fat. <laughs> <laughs> Little Rudy and the guy who plays Gomez are related. They're both short. That doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, why would a guy who's the son of a witchy sort of man want to destroy evil with Frodo? That's his dad. So she wanted to make a basically an Adams Family TV show before it became a TV show back in the 50s. And because it was such a delicious parody of family sitcoms at a time like the Webster's. So she went to the party dressed as Morticia Adams, who again was not named at the time. <laughs> basically, it was like I just had a black slinky dress that was like cut low in the breast area. She rented a black wig and she powdered herself white. Basically, this costume cost her $4. <laughs> and damn it, if that costume wasn't a hit that night. She won the Valkyrie. She won the Valkyrie costume contest that night and she was noticed by KABC program director Hunt Stromberg Jr., son of the MGM producer Hunt Stromberg. His son, Jr., would later go on to produce shows like Shows We Love, Beverly Hills Billy. The Beverly Hills Billies? The Beverly Hills Billies. <laughs> Beverly Hill Billies, Hogan's Heroes, Lost in Space, Green Acres, Gilligan's Island. Producer. I'm in the blow up. Uh, it's supposed to be a three hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was too much trouble putting the Charles Adams comic strip onto television, what with the money and the rights and all that. But KABC did have a horror movie package that they planned airing late from 10 30 to midnight, I believe. But they had no way to present these B movies to the audience. That's what they used to do back in the day. They used to have like yeah. a commentator, the basically. Late show. Yeah. Mindless job, or more appropriate, Vampire's job, was to present these films to an audience, explain who was in it and what it was about. TV was odd back then. But damn it, I prefer it. She redid her Morticia outfit with a lean of the influence of erotic magazine bizarre and some more vamp elements not vampire but vamp a pale strong female like this was a silent movie era Tallulah Bankhead mm. Clara Bow Gloria Swanson Theta Barra. she also threw in the dragon lady from Terry and the Pirates it was a tug <laughs> can't let that go a tug towards like the dominatrix looks but that was, she wasn't even aware that was a thing yet like she just knew from bizarre magazine like oh mm. like slinking the tummy area oh, I can wear a ball gag her husband came up with the, I, I can talk with the ball guy, yeah, sure. No. Her husband came up with the name for her character and called her Vampira, which I've said already like four times, so it's not a surprise. Yeah, yeah. The big reveal, yeah, spoiled it. And now her contract with Kate. So, it, it, so no connection to vampire at all. I mean, yeah, she kind of made the connection. To vampire, yeah. But she's not like, she doesn't play a vampire, though. Well, I mean, she kind of does. It's kind of vampiric. It's vampiric, yeah. I don't know. I don't know Dean Reisner's logic behind it, but it's a good name. <laughs> now, who wrote Dracula? Who wrote, who wrote it? Dracula? Bram Stoker. Now, what would Bram Stoker think about this? <laughs> Bram Stoker? Why couldn't we think of Bram Stoker? I thought of Francis Ford Coppola twice, so... Didn't he write the original novel, <laughs> Velda and Paler? Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula by <laughs> Bram Stoker. <laughs> he wants to do it so dark. Okay, let's talk about her contract, which was kind of odd, the one that she had with Kate. My favorite part of every episode, the contract negotiations. <laughs> this was with Channel 7 KABC. <laughs> really? Yeah, this is where it first aired. Foreshadows trouble to come. <laughs> no agent or lawyer is listed. Did Disney own it yet? No. What are you, banana pants? No, I didn't own it yet. It's just bananas in my pants. <laughs> Stop saying that. Yes, I'm happy to see you. Yes, I am happy to see you, but it's also a banana in my <laughs> pants. So there's no agent or lawyer listed. The performer designation is left blank. Check payable to Vampira, not Myla Nermi, but also check payable to Vampira Care of KABC program director, the man who discovered her, Hunt Stromberg Jr. As R.H. Green says in his documentary Vampire Me, it's a contract between a major corporation and a fictional character. <laughs> there isn't confirmation on this being the final contract she signed, but it at least shows KABC's sort of intentions. Of manipulating her? Yeah, basically. She could play her character on national TV, sure, but KABC could refuse her rights to do that. But with that, Vampira had her own trick brewing in the cauldron. FYI, I know she's not a witch, she's more of a vampire, but they don't <laughs> have cauldrons, I get it. If a woman wears black, she's a witch. <laughs> that applies today. 2016. <laughs> Myla Nermi had creative control over vampire, 51% to 49%, which is pretty cool. She owned the character and had creative call over the show and they would simply broadcast it. She made around $60 a week from the studios, all spent on body makeup and taxis, and she was being supported <laughs> by her husband. While she was the creator of the character and most of the show, writer Peeth Rothenstein was the writer for most of the sketches in the movie pattern. The two worked really well together. The pilot, which was called Dig Me Later Vampira, which was later just called Vampire Show, <laughs> first aired on April 30th, 1954. The intro, I don't have you ever seen the intro to this before? It's yeah. like not a lot of her show exists. The intro, which was just used as a promo, which is why it still exists because it was like a commercial. Like I said, it's one of the only surviving minutes of the show. It's a long, dark hallway. It's candles. It's really spooky. There's fog. And you see Vampira slink out of the dark, foggy hallway. She walks right up to the camera and screams, like a howling <laughs> scream, which we, she would later try to play off as like it was a not an orgasm. <laughs> 
orgasm. I tripped. I tripped on an orgasm. <laughs> there was a spider on the camera. <laughs> she screams really loud and then she kind of like comes down into like a seductive smile. It's really cool. And that's how she intros the show. Nobody had ever seen anything like that on TV before, but there's like four things on TV. You should watch it. They like, hadn't seen a lot of things on TV. It's like on a, a woman. <laughs> like a woman without her husband nearby. Hey, get married. You, Daniel, and anybody listening, watch it. It's it's super spooky and fun. Right. It's it's a lot of, it's really great. Will I be scared? What are you scared of? Women? A screaming women who have, you know, pleasurable experiences. And fog machines? Yeah, you're yeah. going to be scared. <laughs> especially, yeah. especially fog machines. <laughs> Most of all, the fog machines. <laughs> Dry ice. And me. white makeup. So not only had American audiences not seen anything that deliciously spooky and fun on TV before, they'd never seen anyone like Vampira before. Mm-hmm. Especially in the 50s when the atomic family... A Finnish family- person. Yeah, exactly. What is this person? Her eyebrows are so weird. Is she Swedish or is she Norwegian? <laughs> Either way, she doesn't belong here. <laughs> Especially in the 50s when the atomic family and the modern housewife was being pushed at the public at all times because we're not communists. Mm-hmm. Everyone has aprons on. <laughs> and that girl, Vampira, was slender. Like, frighteningly no. skinny. Her measurements were... Well, this she, means- she doesn't eat pies every day. Mm. Well, isn't she getting enough gelatin? Has she not eaten mayonnaise dipped in Vienna sausages yet? (laughs) She didn't eat lettuce with blue cheese and little bits of bacon all over it? She didn't eat a pineapple stuffed with duck? She didn't eat a jello mold? (laughs) She didn't eat a jello mold that has black olives inside of it? She didn't have milk (laughs) that has gravy poured into it? She didn't have an old-fashioned poured in milk with hamburger patties? She didn't eat poached eggs? She didn't eat poached eggs filled with spam? (laughs) I'd like to order the last buffalo, please. That was a long rant on 50s food. It just makes me sick. <laughs> For measurements, this means nothing to regular boys who are scared of women like you and me. Hmm? Measurements are 38, 17, 36, which her waist was terribly skinny. Uh, the only time I hear those sorts of 17, oh, 38, three, that's when I'm playing football. I don't know anything about <laughs> measurements. I play football. <laughs> I, 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 I try on my, these. That's my, I don't put on dresses and I play football. <laughs> football that's my husco longer combination because i never left still rule that place <laughs> she had like a nothing waist like zero like frighteningly skinny as a writer w scott Poole put it she appeared like she didn't have a womb very unmother-like which was again uh, insane this is ridiculous the way <laughs> insane they didn't know what to do with a woman like this on tv it was the, the where's her womb where do her babies come from <laughs> she spit them up vampire was on an insane 50s diet at the time that sounds pretty dangerous whoa, whoa, whoa was she oh my god stop it um <laughs> so she basically learned that what eats away the fat from a cooking steak is papaya powder so she mixed papaya powder with a cream and applied okay. it basically inventing a spot reducing cream the powder tenderized the fiber and sow so once it was applied around her waist she wrapped a rubber tube around her waist and slept in it opening the pores and eating the flesh away she was that's horrifying she would fast for a day and a half she would okay here's what i think i understand thursday night she applies the cream she wakes up friday and begins fasting friday night she takes a steam bath and begins to hydrate continues fasting all through saturday saturday night she gets cinched into her costume and then she films the episode and then immediately binge eats till Monday. If this was too oh. tedious, too bad because she had to force herself into this. This was the image she created for Vampira and she had to carry it out. Boy. Zero waste was her signature. That's so sad. Like I said before, the show itself is almost completely lost, but it sounds so incredible. Mm-hmm. She's super funny. If you catch her on any other show, she was on other shows and those are restored or not restored, but they're preserved. Super funny. If you ever see her, she was called affectionately the camp vamp. She's a wisecracker. Everyone wants you to think that she's so like noir seductress and she's like this ingenue or whatever, but she really loved puns. She loved being silly. She was like the proto horror host and she honestly, even the lamest of the horror hosts doesn't stray that far from Vampire's model <laughs> that she set up. To be fair, they're all the lamest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, she's not that much better. <laughs> she smokes like she's Joan from Mad Men while she's doing all this <laughs> by the way. She makes fun of movies. She has a pet spider named Rolo that she would speak to. Yeah, well, my person had a beetle named Sandoz. <laughs> Everybody got pet. There were sketches on the show. One time she played like a Groucho Marx character. It was like a one-woman show, like kind of like whatever Carol Burnett did. <laughs> one of her close friends made an appearance on the show. Vampire played a librarian type alongside him. Many people tried to scandalize their friendship of her and this guy, but she maintains it was platonic, and I, I believe it. She said they were psychically drawn to one another. This friend of hers was named James Dean, huh. and although he hadn't made a splash yet, his new style of acting and his good looks and overdramatic demeanor guaranteed he was going to be somebody. She had a small group of these Nighthawk type bohemian artists. They would call themselves the Night Watch, and they'd all hang around all night diner googies listen to episode googie go go for more information on that restaurant the googie of their the life just hanging out with james cool? dean at, at a va- diner at vampira yeah. in a diner a at real four life, in the morning a real life recreation of that picture where james dean and elvis and, <laughs> and michael <Marilyn> jackson <laughs> they're playing pool or whatever the googie of choice was the one next to schwab's at sunset crescent heights schwab's is where all the big money hollywood stars would go and the outcasts like them would go to googies and the two groups hated each other so they were at the actual not just a googie place they were at googies, googies. 
movies. Yeah, wow. they were at Gooey's and they hang out there. Right next door were all like Frank Sinatra. Yeah. They were, like did not get along with anybody. <laughs> and that outsiderness fed her portrayal and her image of Vampire. The problem with that rebellious nature of hers was that Vampire was getting very popular. People loved the show. She was not just a hit locally, which it should have been. She was getting write-ups in different magazines, and so she was becoming like a national hit. She made the cover of People of TV in 1955. She had a Life magazine spread dedicated to her. One of the TV stations, it might have been Life magazine, I'm not really sure. They hired an old Packard carriage, which looks like the Adams Family, yes, kind of car, and they got a chauffeur to drive Vampire around Los Angeles to promote the show, and the photos are fantastic. <laughs> There's one, my favorite of her is like her scaring a small child out of the car. It's, it's, she's just being driven around town. She received the Emmy nomination for the most outstanding female television personality of 1954 for a sitcom. What? Uh, that was a category? I guess so. Ruthless EC horror comics with their Crypt Keeper horror host at the time had come and gone already, but Vampyro is around for their, just to coincide perfectly almost with the son of EC horror comics, Mad Magazine. Hmm. That's exactly what stemmed from them. So the two of them were almost birthing camp together. <laughs> Bobby Bear wrote a neat song called Vampyro. Listen to it. Then the first strike Do comes. It now. Let's pause this. I played alongside. It doesn't matter what <laughs> I say. Then the first strike comes from KBC when they attempt to strike lightning twice. They decide that if Vampyro worked for horror and B-movies, they needed another host for cheap romantic flicks that they had the license is to it, play. Are you about to go into the history of Fabio? This is because I starts. am too. Yeah. This is how porn starts. And thus, Voluptua was born, played by Gloria Paul, a former cheesecake model and dancer. Voluptua was a sort of like soft-spoken, plain Jane, blonde seductress, like a love goddess. She wanted, like a mistress. She wanted to She sounds like a Pokemon. Go catch her and see what you catch. Like people would say, like it was borderline pornographic for the time and it was canceled through the protest. It didn't have much of effect on Vampyra other than just revealing that KBC was trying to replicate what they were doing with mm. Vampyra. They were trying to replicate the success. Vampyra worked for them because truly it was cheap to make it and it was a dead slide. It was 10.30 to 12. That's why they wanted to do it. Yeah. But now that she was becoming more popular, they wanted to have creative control over the character to ensure that they wouldn't lose money if she left and Milo wouldn't give up control of Vampyra. So they were trying to like, okay, well, we need something that we can control so we don't want to lose money. They were talking about making the Vampyra show a national show broadcast through different local TV stations with different actresses so playing be, Vampyra. Uh, the mantle of the vamp exactly which Milo obviously wasn't happy about this was her character <laughs> so one day they just cancelled the vampire show without any wow. notice Kaput. Great. she then took the character to competing and they gave it to a man pyro <laughs> <laughs> vampiro I can't come up with a name for him he sets everything in fire because he's a vampiro but then he hates fire it's a self con man versus man I don't know monster versus monster get Rod Serling to write this took the <laughs> to serve man pyro <laughs> <laughs> she took the vampire show to competing network KHJ, which was Channel 9. They picked her up briefly, but her... Oh, I wrote death span as a pun. Not a pun, but a play on lifespan. Her lifespan on that station <laughs> didn't last that much longer. Would you call that a death span? <laughs> I don't think that I would. My ghost writer must have thought this was funny. <laughs> the KABC Vampire Show ran for 54 shows. Yeah. That's a year and two weeks for Channel wait 7. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, so that, that was the death span of the show? Yeah. 54 weeks? Okay. 54 weeks, yeah. No, the death span for Channel yeah. 9 wasn't that much longer is what I'm saying. Mm. It didn't last that long. Mm. Her death span <laughs> for ABC. Hey, I'm, it's catching on. <laughs> it was 54 shows, which was a year it's and two taken weeks. The, it's taken the nation by stormy night <laughs> dark and stormy night <laughs> it uh, was a dark and stormy podcast <laughs> for channel 9 vampire only aired for 13 weeks so around this time she divorces dean reisner 13. they break up no, we're going to end you exactly at 13 for uh, thematic purposes. <laughs> it's theatrical. Yeah. We could wait for 666 uh, weeks, but no. <laughs> There's two options here. <laughs> <laughs> we could either go now or we could wait a really long time. Or we can go like after Happy Days goes off the air. We'll find out. You'll end around the time that Joni Loves Chachi starts. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a crossover. 1955, she separates from her husband, Dean Reisner. Her friendship with James mm -hmm. Dean is starting oh, to like become that. rocky as his fame rises. Is he, is he the Dean? And yeah, James, James Dean Reisner. They're not on good terms when James Dean is killed in a car accident that same year. Mm, she is absolutely she is absolutely crushed by his death, and his ghost seems to haunt her. Poor choice of words. She's like brokenhearted about this. Like they, I watch interviews with her as an older woman, and she like looks away from the camera when she talks about James Dean, and she like uh, finds different things to talk about. And they're like, uh, "How did you feel when he died?" She's like, "I don't know." Let's talk about Buddy Holly. <laughs> <laughs> I had his wallet in my pocket when he died. <laughs> Because I'm Waylon Jennings. It's weird that both her and Natalie Wood, when James Dean died, were both like a part of their psyche was crushed. Yeah, well, at least Natalie Wood didn't have to deal with it for that long. Yeah, Natalie Wood like built weird shrines to him after he died. Vampira, like, oh my god, I'll tell you this. So after Vampira, she has to resort to doing like cheap gigs. She like has opening car dealerships. Uh, According to the documentary, she was riding in USC's home punning, home punning, home, home punning queen. Home punning queen. She would like that. She would love her and Forey Ackerman would love that. <laughs> they um, should have gotten married. He had Wendy. I'm, I'm just writing my fan fiction <laughs> version of LA history. She would ride in the homecoming parades. Like I said in the documentary, they mentioned that she was cast in a California traffic campaign to warn people against the dangers of automobile accidents and on display was James Dean's death car, the wreckage, oh. and it didn't go well.
she left like weeping isn't that insane why would they do that i have no I, maybe they didn't realize that they were like really good pals still <laughs> yeah so she gets on a few more shows at vampira which is great because that is more surviving footage we have of myla in character and it's, yeah, we get to watch her with cal worthington <laughs> <laughs> one is on the george global show and it gives us the longest running sketch we see of vampira it's an old-time tv show which is pretty fun and you you'd like it of course it uh she was on a it's, it's actually super funny she's on a like what's my line type show called place to face she appeared on the red skeleton show and alongside bella Lugosi during his career downfall. They continue to plummet together. A also, real vampire. Also, apparently, there's a honeymooner sketch with Peter Laurie as a Ralph character who drives a hearse and Vampira plays the wife akin to Alice. Oh boy. All fun. Oh boy. Him trying to play a One Ralph. of these nights. <laughs> One of these, I don't know. I, I always do Bob One Dylan. of these nights. That's it. One of these nights. nights bang zoom. <laughs> straight to the bat over the moon. So here's the thing. She keeps appearing but it's always as Vampira, never as Myla. She went to parties as Vampira not Myla. She would refer to Vampira in the third person. It became like a sort of symbiotic spider thing. Spider. Then the gigs began to dry up. Things were looking really bad and that's what Ed Wood comes calling. Oh, no. If you haven't seen Tim Burton's Ed Wood, please God do yourself a favor. It's so good. But in case you just don't want to watch it, don't want to listen to me, here's the gist of it. Ed Wood is regarded as the worst director of all time. I don't know about that. And his opus was a film called Plan 9 from Outer Space, also regarded by some, not me, as the worst film of all time. <laughs> it's not. Me. Again, Ed Wood didn't want her as Myla in the movie. He wanted the character Vampira to appear in the film. She agreed to do it and she agreed to do it as long as she didn't have to speak any of Edward's stupid 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 lines <laughs> she even did that makeup slightly different so it looks like an odd cousin of Vampyra mm. and she only appears if not a couple times then just once like I'm trying to remember all the scenes she says I think it's just one time she just paid $200 for it she <laughs> had to take the bus to the uh, studio in full costume like a private bus she had to pay a dollar twenty five for a private bus, and there was a bunch of other people riding in their own private bus. So at the time, she was living at fifty six oh seven Carlton Way in Hollywood, which is near Hollywood Boulevard and Western. At this time, she was becoming very reclusive and very paranoid that people were trying to steal the character from her. Well, she became very kind of did, yeah. and she was right to think that people were coming after her. People began attacking Nermi. One instance was at a beauty salon. Someone trying to burn her scalp, which what? I don't know if you ever seen pictures of Vampira with just a peak and like a bald head. It's because someone tried to she had to shave her head. Another person grabbed her near Crescent Heights. They just grabbed her in the street that same year christmas an apartment fire from a lit cigarette almost kills her and her friend charles beetles the beetle the mania, beetle mania. Yeah. her arms and hands were burned during this while she was trying to save her cat they're all first degree burns uh. she was 34 at the time life was getting really rough and frankly the public was getting sick of vampira she was the girl of the minute like any sports illustrated model but now the minute was up she hobbled along she got a small part in 1959's the beat generation she had short hair and she tells a poem with a the rat beat? on her the beat generation <laughs> mania <laughs> in the movie she like is reciting the poem she has a rat on her shoulder <laughs> Oh, I love it. It's Myla in this movie. It's Myla, but it's very Vampira. Mm. It's like has a weird Vampira feel to it. It's just something funny. In 1958, she marries a much younger man named John Brinkley, who had a bit part in one of my favorite B movies, Bucket of Blood. What's funny about Bucket of Blood is that it's a sort of parody of the Beat Generation, <laughs> which she just had a small part. But Bucket of Blood takes place in Venice, California. It's one of my favorite California horror movies. The marriage doesn't last long. Whatever. <laughs> so she goes to Vegas for a while, and a although horror movie into its own, <laughs> she goes to Vegas for a while. And although many say she began dating Elvis Presley, she maintains they only necked. They only neck and light around talking about oh, deep. What a neck! <laughs> they only light around talking about deep philosophical things. From what I hear about Elvis, yeah, he probably just did. How big of a hoagie is too big? <laughs> that's the sort of thing. <laughs> Think about like dying in a toilet. No, never. That's awful. <laughs> How much cocaine can a body have? In it? <laughs> like really though. She then went to New York to see if she could find a better work. Nothing really came her way. While she was in New York, she was attacked by a crazy person who mm. broke into her apartment. He beat and choked her. He used a straight razor to cut her clothes off. What? He threatened her, and he possibly, most likely. Had his way with her she escaped the situation naked bleeding and managed to get help the police got her and they asked her to take photos of the abuse marks for her record and on impulse she posed almost seductively for the shots it's I remember seeing the photos before and I had no Sunset idea what was Sunset Boulevard all yeah, over again pretty much Sunset Boulevard <laughs> I've seen the photos before and I didn't really know what I was looking at and now that I know I'm like I'm broken hearted that's so sad why did she activate this in people I don't know what it was I really don't know what it was weird they didn't know I how to handle a woman the, like that on TV maybe maybe that's what it was maybe I just think this happened all the time back then and yeah. like and because then, she's famous we're hearing yeah. about it how tragic is <laughs> every that every woman was going through this and, and yeah, the, only the famous ones you'd hear it from <laughs> she got one more opportunity to show off Vampira in Liberace's live show Come As You Were in 1956 <laughs> as the warm up act for a headliner oh, Liberace boy. she thought it was going to be her comeback his to his wavy TV. hair is just <laughs> 
so <laughs> heterosexual. <laughs> There's something about it. Sometimes all glitter is gold. And he's wearing all of it. And boy, is that guy gold. <laughs> all that glitters is something Liberace touched. <laughs> she thought this was going to be her comeback to TV, but it was not. Mm. In the end, we know as little of her childhood and upbringing as we have footage of her show. And that's kind of it for Vampira. She, Milo's career in Hollywood is kind of, that's it. She trudged along doing odd jobs for small wages. She sold handmade jewelry out of a store called Vampire's Attic. She sold- That's uh, so weird that my witch also went into like an antique dealership. Yeah, that's mm. what you do when you're an old lady in Los Angeles. <laughs> she sold celebrity gravestone rubbings. In 1962, she got skilled at carpentry and became the manager of a linoleum tile warehouse. That is unsettling. During all this though- Hollywood! <laughs> during all of this, little Cassandra Peterson is growing up. She got burned too, right? Yeah, she got burned she got as a burned child. on Easter. Burn scars or not, bullied to the point of tears or not, she wanted to be seen. Did she connect to uh, Vampira's burns? Like, what do you mean? They, not like did they rub burn scars no, uh, but did she see like oh she's burned uh, I'm burned not really yeah. they don't have too much time together yeah, you could, yeah. Uh, you, enough to have that moment of like it. you're burned like I'm burned yeah. she was bullied a lot for her appearance but she still wanted attention Peterson started dancing as early as five years old tap dancing ballet and such when she was seven the Peterson moved to Colorado Springs Colorado where she was once again bullied because of her scarring and as she gets older she starts joining theater groups and it becomes more active she starts acting she grows up loving the Twilight Zone she loves horror movies her mom owning a costume shop has his perk because she's always best dressed for Halloween. At a certain age, her body starts to grow. And I'm talking about necessarily in a perverted way, but yeah, that too. But her burn marks start stretching out with the skin grafting and it starts sort of like blending. Oh, so that's good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, she uses a lot of body cream to cover it up, but like it's she less She should use that stuff that eats away the <laughs> stomach of the that, That'll work. Yeah, that'll help. <laughs> she becomes more confident about her body. She starts looking a lot older than she actually is. On a trip to California with I her fam. I don't like the way you're describing her. This is the way she describes herself in an interview, okay? I don't... It becomes relevant right now. On a trip to California with her family, they stopped in Las Vegas. Oh, on this no. trip... I really don't like where this is it's, going. It's kind of odd. On this trip, she convinced her parents to sneak her into a showgirl review at the Dunes Hotel because she wanted to go so bad. She wanted to be a showgirl so bad. They snuck her in. She was 17 at the time because she was so whiny. <laughs> then just sitting there, she got noticed by a maitre d'. He noticed her growing body, with, uh, gross, and, and, and her on-point makeup because she did that because she wanted to appear more as an adult. Mm -hmm. And they said that she looked better than some of the dancers. Boy, did it work. Mm -hmm. He asked her if she was a dancer. She said, no, but I want to be. And soon after, the mistress of the show named Fluff came out and began asking her if she wanted to dance. So then they took her backstage and she took her parents to the best seats and she admitted that she was only 17, but she's like, well, if you get your parents to sign a consent form, we can hire you. Stay an extra day and we'll audition you. And they got her parents to stay another day. She auditioned and they're like, okay, well, you're great. Come back in August. So now she just needs her parents to sign a consent form and they won't. They wouldn't do it. So <laughs> she parent. basically whined and cried for three months until they're like, fine, be a showgirl. <laughs> so in 1969, she graduated high school and immediately left home for Vegas to become a showgirl. She must have been listening to Hubner's album <laughs> come on sign this consent form so i can have an orgy <laughs> God, pile of bodies well, fluff wanted it so she becomes at the time is the youngest showgirl at the time and who noticed her but the king himself elvis presley who can smell ghoul on any woman <laughs> and although many reports say they briefly dated what peterson made, <laughs> how do you feel about big hoagies <laughs> many websites say that they briefly dated they probably hung out for one night they just necked they probably just necked they just necked and waxed philosophical <laughs> about toilets he warned her to leave vegas don't stick around to which she said yes sir they sang a couple songs at the piano <laughs> that's together. not what he warned me when he said viva las vegas <laughs> don't listen to the song go blue hawaii i'll be back <laughs> they sang a couple songs together at the piano and said hey you should be a singer and she immediately started taking vocal lessons <laughs> ready to leave vegas for bigger opportunities but not before losing her virginity to not the king but the court jester tom jones <sighs> and apparently there's something i didn't know about tom jones he that says that is unusual here's something i didn't know about tom jones he has sort of a milton burrow rep Reputation. No, he doesn't. And their counter with one another required stitches after a little bleeding. Gross on top of gross on top of gross. Oh, he should be arrested. That's... Moving on. That is... Yeah. Horrific. Looking up like Cassandra Peter biography, guess what the third thing was? <laughs> so at the age of 17, still 17, she uh, leaves Vegas for Italy. The, uh, I, the, I hate the 60s. <laughs> Consensual sex. Oh my God. Consensual underage sex that requires <laughs> surgery when you're done. What's weird about that? What happens in Vegas uh, haunts you. <laughs> I forgot that it was underage for a minute. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That, that's the awful part. Yeah. So in Italy, she becomes a singer for an Italian pop rock band called I Latinus Ochatnuts and the Snails who toured around together. Goobly God blip blops and the squirrels. <laughs> the squirrels so she also scores a small part in a fellini film roma really but that started getting boring and a contract from playboy <laughs> as and fellini does as fellini does a contract from playboy and mean french women sent her back to the states <laughs> so she once again joins a theater review called mama and the boys which had seven young men and her i imagine she was mama <laughs> this was the late 70s now and now she comes back to la and around this time is probably one of my favorite cassandra peterson stories take a look to the album cover to tom waits small change it has tom waits looking cool and beat as hell and an almost nude red 
redhead dancer standing off to the side by her makeup table is this Cassandra Peterson. She can't even remember. <laughs> she thinks it's her. Drugs. Don't <laughs> do them. She looks at it like, I think that's me. I met Tom Waits. <laughs> if I met Tom Waits, I would be like, I know Tom Waits. <laughs> Around this time, she joins Groundlings in LA. And really? some of her improv partners are Lorraine Newman, John Lovitz, Phil Hartman, and Paul Pee Wee Rubens. Imagine if she was on Saturday Night Live. Like, she made it to Saturday Night Live. I would have loved that. <laughs> just like Myla Nurmi, she's surrounded by talent and fame, just waiting to be activated in some way. I mean, she, uh, Fellini, Elvis, Tom Jones, uh, <laughs> Pee Wee, like, Pee Wee Herman. Like, she's surrounded by all this, but nothing's clicking yet. She has a small part in a movie called Working Girls, which displayed her showgirl talents. She was an episode of Chips. She was an episode of Happy Days. Ooh, that's around the time Vampira went off the air. After episode 666. <laughs> and then they dragged that thing on. <laughs> they jumped the shark after 600. <laughs> I mean, they had 600 great episodes. But then the shark jumped after that because it was a bad shark. <laughs> Come 1980 and Myla Nurmi has resurrected Vampira to help raise money for organizations that help aid stray animals. And Channel 9, KHTV, her old home, sees her and thinks, hmm, money. Channel 9 had his own horror host at the time, Seymour, for years, but he was planning on retiring and they wanted to find an adequate replacement. What a great name. I've seen a picture of him. He kind of looks like, is it John Carradine? When he plays Dracula, he sort of has like a fedora and a little suit. He looks like a sick Doc Holiday. <laughs> He's the lodger. <laughs> so they contact Myla Nurmi by doing a vampire type show using her name with Myla again in creative control position, willing to pass on the torch of Vampira. And at the time, Nurmi was 65 and living on social security in a small apartment in Hollywood. Her negotiations with Channel 9 went on for about three months, but there was two things rubbing Myla the wrong way. Number one, she wanted to pick who would be the next vampire. She has great control. That's fair. In my opinion, that's fair. There were rumors that she wanted singer and dancer Lola Falana, who was a black woman who sang alongside Sammy David Jr. to play the part of vampire that I can't confirm that or not. I don't know if that's true, but another choice, which was, I think, confirmed was an English actress named Martine Beswick, who was best known for her role in Thunderball, Wait. which is a Bond film. I don't James know how- Bond. James James the second thing that was bugging her was that she sensed that KHJ wanted creative control of the character and they pretty much did. They wanted all the rights to Vampira and that was all she had left was the rights to this character that she created. Mm -hmm. That she was the first horror host and she just doesn't want to give it up so she backed out of the project and KHJ TV had already been working on producing this show so they couldn't have Vampira so they would hire a new girl, give her a new name and continue with the show. So that's what they did and they had a girl in mind. Enter Cassandra Peterson one more time <laughs> who is doing crappy jobs like office secretarial work and she's just waiting for roles. Someone hints to her that Channel 9 is looking for a horror host but Peterson doesn't even know what a horror host is she has no frame of reference her only frame of reference is Bozo the Clown <laughs> my <laughs> favorite horror host he's <laughs> just a horror horror host <laughs> he's a host and he's horrible he inspires horror <laughs> so she went to this audition unaware of anything and she found the casting room was full of pale women with fake fangs all dressed in black uh, so she auditions for the role that she's playful because she's an improv and she like plays around she's very likable she's insanely beautiful and the role of this newly named Elvira is given to Peterson and Myla Nurmi publicly lashes out at Peterson nope. which bums Peterson out mm. because she wants to be liked by this person who had this role and she can't understand why she's so angry. Do the research, Cassie. Come <laughs> why, on. Why is it Elvira? Why the name Elvira? This just changing one syllable. <laughs> the Vira in Spanish. Elvira's movie Macabre first airs September 26, 1981 with the showing of 1972's Grave of the Vampire. The show doesn't really know how to find its footing. She has her look down basically. If you're unfamiliar with the way she looks, her breasts are barely covered by a long slinky dress with a slit up her leg and she modeled her hair after Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes mm -hmm. with pale men makeup and sharp winged eyeliner. At first she played a role mysterious and sexy and sort of like had like a almost femme fatale thing. But as the caliber of movies were presented, she started being more playful and joking. She becomes more of a jokester and all of it. She like really plays up like an 80s valley girl tone that was really popular at the time. The show is so full of like silly sexual innuendo. It's really funny. Straight up bashing of horror movies. They had a character named The Breather who would call Elvira and tell her really weird <laughs> jokes. The voice was done by an actor and the writer, I think the writer for the show named John Paragon, who was also Jombie on Pee Wee's Playhouse. Which one's Jombie? Jombie was the gene that lives in the TV. Oh, yeah. wow. Hey, Jombie! <laughs> and she was a hit, like, almost right off the bat. Like, people loved her. Roger Ebert called uh, Elvira a cross between Gina Lola Bridger and Vampirella, not Vampira. Hmm. Vampirella, again, creation of Forry Ackerman. Her show was, again, a local show, but her playfulness made her a national hit. The following year 1982 Elvira became the first horror host to be taped in 3D for television broadcast and more than 2.7 million pairs of 3D glasses were sold and we all know why <laughs> there were two things they wanted to see <laughs> I got a one eye for each and Elvira became a frequent of the tonight show starring Johnny Carson and we all know why <laughs> 
<laughs> he's got one eye for each. <laughs> and his tip to her was to keep the show low budget and kind of grimy. He said that when you get more money, the temptation to upgrade the production value will come, but it'll sacrifice the silliness of the show, which he, they just kind of stuck by. They never mm. like upgrade. It was always really low budget. Her husband at the time, Mark Pearson, also happened to be her business manager, along with his partner, Eric Gardner, and Gardner's wife, Janice. The four of them together seemed to control the marketing of Vampira, and that's really cool in the end. What's the name of that police that shot a bunch of cops? Dorner. 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 No, not Gardner. Yeah, Dorner. no, Dorner. Yeah. <laughs> We're thinking of a black African-American, black African-American. The black African-American. Yeah, the black guy who was killed in Oakland, right? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was New York. Oh, was it New York? Who's yeah. killed in Oakland? Do we even want to start this? Do we have enough time to list everyone who's killed? <laughs> Unjustly killed by police. So the four of them together, these two couples, had creative control over the marketing of Alrira. And that's pretty cool. Alrira? Alrira. She started a long-running series of Halloween-themed Coors Light commercials, which they covered her chest up for that, as well as Mug Root Beer, again, covering her chest up. She started making appearances as Alvira at different conventions, on different TV shows, and a variety, like all these products were slapped with Alvira's image. Let's go back for a second to Myla Nurmi, 1982, that same year that Alvira's becoming popular and... Milo Nurmi's watching all of this happen. <laughs> Jersey punk band and lovers of all things horror and B-movie, The Misfits, dedicated a song to Vampyra called Vampyra. And there's a photo of her with a band standing in front of Vinyl Finish on Melrose, and it's splendid. They look like they belong together. They, she looks like The Misfits' grandma. She dressed like Vampyra one more time, and kind of like a withered old lady, but it's so cool. If you like The Misfits, it's pretty cool. If you like old women taken care of by young men, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. In Milo Nurmi's later years, she began to get a cult following both as Vampyra and as the woman who played her. Both people as a lonely witch woman of Los Angeles but she was getting credit for that people like loved her as this little old lady who once played vampire was walking around Los Angeles the underground punk scene would seem to like keep her busy the singer for the punk band The Screamers to Monta the Plenty cast her in his really awful movie Population One she sang sorta mostly just read religious pamphlets along to a beat for two <laughs> songs for the band Satan's Cheerleaders and the I believe the lead singer kind of took care of her British punk band The Dam dedicated the song to her called Plan 9 Channel 7 which is a really good song <laughs> cut back to Elvira meanwhile around the same time she takes over a responsibility of hosting the annual Halloween haunt at Knott's Berry Farm replacing really once again, once again replacing Seymour no, you mean Knott's Scary Farm I don't know if it was Scary Farm at the time Knott's Frightening Farm yeah Knott's Frightening <laughs> yeah they want to go for alliteration the most humble place on earth oh by the way Seymour's name is Larry Vincent he also helps keep the tone of the show going from his show to her show so like he is almost credited with helping write it anyways her Knott's gig was like a full on show like a musical comedy review at Knott's introducing her to an even broader audience Peterson thought this horror host gig was going to be like a temporary thing she thought she would do improv be a horror host and still have to be a secretary all at the same time she didn't know that was a full-time job it was a full-time job <laughs> and she wasn't really ready for that role yet it was exciting as what you know but it just wasn't what she wanted but money the character won't stop being popular and she appeared one more time on Alice Cooper's on Feed My Frankenstein with a bunch of other 80s people and again just kept ballooning out of control to the point where she couldn't control Elvira's image anymore you almost see the difference between the 50s and the 80s in how they're both portrayed this is scandalous in the 50s and this is like the 80s version of what scandal would be where <laughs> she's like popping out of her top she's got like wild hair it's funny to look at the two of them and like you're what sort of controversy is in each era <laughs> Movie Macabre which was her show was in production and airs until like 1986 but it was in syndication so reruns continually played for years, some of which were shot for Australia, making Elvira the first international horror host. Huh. Around this time, 1985-ish, she has a small cameo in her old Groundlings Pals movie, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, the scene where Pee-wee gets attacked by the bikers in the bar, the red-headed woman who comes up like, I say you let me have him first, that's Elvira. <laughs> well, actually, it's Cassandra Peterson. In 1988, her small circle of business associates, along with John Paragon, Jambi, and another writer, Sam Egan, they write and put together Elvira's first movie, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, which explains Elvira's origin story. It's very enjoyable if you haven't seen it origin story. It captures her character perfectly. Meanwhile, Myla Nurmi has been watching as Elvira again has ballooned out of control and she's taking over the world and she doesn't like it. So mm -hmm. in 1989 Myla Nurmi took Cassandra Peterson and KHJ to court saying that they stole Vampyra character and Elvira was 75 to 80% Vampyra with mm -hmm. some parts missing They and did the some... DNA test. <laughs> you are the mother. Some things were missing, some things were added but her claim really was that Elvira took Vampyra's low cut black dress and basic pun on B-movie setup but that's by this time like every horror host has done this. Eventually, though, Nermi had to drop yeah, the case. I'd like to see Zachary squeeze into that. <laughs> no one's Van Gulli can do it. Nermi had to drop the case because she lacked the legal and financial support. She lost the lawsuit. It was a huge blow to her. She had to sign the defeated contract. She did it once as Myla and again as Vampira. She signed it twice. So through the 90s, Avira reruns continued 
the air, while a slew of Avira products such as calendars and costumes and comic books and train cards and pinball machines and dolls are all released. She becomes the most popular horror host of all time, even pretty much to this day. Her image becomes more popular than the show, just like Vampyra. Like, we know her more as the character than we know anything from the show. In 1993, there was an attempt to put Elvira in a sitcom, but it didn't really last. <laughs> it was supposed to be like Bewitched, Elvira in Manhattan, Kansas, where Peterson was born, doing her usual innuendo, but it was a no-go. A split side put in an article. At 25 minutes, the show almost runs out of double entendres by the, like, the <laughs> third act. Myla's later years crawled along. A year after Elvira's almost show, 1994, is when Tim Burton makes Ed Wood, and he casts his then-girlfriend Lisa Marie as Vampira. And although the two meet to discuss how they want to portray Vampira, ultimately, Myla isn't happy with the way that she plays Vampira. The film brings attention back to her, and she truly shines in the interviews where they talk to her as an older woman about like her career, because people are like so interested in her. One particular person who reached out to her was the titan of comedy, Dana Gould. Mm lover of all things horror and B-movie. <laughs> and the two strike up a friendship. They're pen pals who live in the same city and he basically becomes her caretaker in later years. And not just Dana Gould, but apparently like many other people who started reaching out to her after Ed Wood. Like I said, like paying rent, getting groceries. I think the guy who wrote Vampyra, Dark Goddess of Horror watched over her and the guy who did the documentary Vampyra Me also like cared for her. Peterson around this time is having career issues. She still wants to be taken seriously as an actress, but she's become trapped by the Alvaro character and she found it hard to escape. That's how everyone knew her. And out of makeup, she doesn't look much like Vampyra, but people still know like she's done it enough times we're like yeah you're Cassandra Peterson you played Alvira talk to us about Alvira she continues appearances three years popping up at conventions in 2007 there was an attempt to create a reality show where Peterson guess what wants to find someone to replace Alvira it was called the search for the next Alvira but it ended after one episode so she has to continue out <laughs> they found <Elvira>. someone <laughs> Myla Nurmi dies in 2008 of a cardiac arrest and she is buried at Hollywood Forever Cemetery directly in or front of or is she <laughs> she is she's buried directly in front of Darren McGavin who played Kolchek the Night Stalker whose first TV movie he hunts down a vampire a Vegas vampire at that even in death. In 2010, Movie Macabre starring Avira returned, and although everyone loved the idea, it only lasted a year. In 2014... What was it on? I think it was mostly like on the internet. In 2014... What's that? Hulu picked up 13 Nights of Elvira, which was well received, but it was only again 13 Nights. Uh, she sort of has a career like Weird Al, where they never stopped working, but like, oh, they're back. <laughs> like every time they do something, oh, they're back. Look at them, they're back. <laughs> Many people were very happy to see the return of old campy Elvira. And although I'm sure Cassandra Peterson loves Elvira, I'm sure she does. It seems like it might be ending soon. There are rumors that she will continue to appear at conventions, but no longer as Elvira, possibly retiring the character. She's been suiting up or down, however you look it up, for 35 years now. She's a beautiful 65 year old woman. And although I've loved Elvira for most of my my life. I'm okay with just seeing Cassandra Peterson from now on. <laughs> we also had another female horror host for a time named Ivana Cadaver, who I sort of watched for a while. I'll do research on her next time. Wait till this, next year, kids. Yeah, I was swallowed up by research for these two. Like I said at the beginning, we gave birth to the very first horror host and the most popular, hmm. and their lives are oddly similar. I didn't know that she was still doing things. Yeah. When she came back in 2010, I'm like, oh, she's back, but she never really left. She's been appearing at, like, Kamikaze for years. Yeah, but come on. I could appear at Kamikaze. <laughs> Bruce Campbell's there. Anybody could show up. <laughs> the only horror host I'm aware of that has stuff in L.A. is Sven Gulli, but he's not. He's from Chicago. Yeah, exactly. But um, they broadcast on MeTV Saturday nights at 10. Thank you, dear. Yeah, I've Ivana Cadaver was sort of peeking here and there, but I could barely catch her, and I think she stopped doing it. My current favorite, Mr. Lobo, who has Cinema Insomnia, who it only shows online, I believe. It's mm. he's like San Francisco based, but I think he has. Yeah, come on, we're not giving them anything. Yeah, it's San Francisco. I'm sorry, but if you're asking what my favorite is, Mr. well, Lobo. I'm not. So now that we've talked about a few uh, witchy sort of women. Vamps. Vamps and witches. Where can they live? I mean, sure, they can live in hell for all of eternity. But in reality, where can they be comfortable? What I'm about to talk to you about now is a witch house. It's mighty, 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 mighty interesting. Uh, this story begins in the spookiest of years, 1920, <gasps> in a soon-to-be-constructed studio owned by a director named Irvin Willett, who had started his career working at Carl Lemley's independent motion picture company, and his brother Carl, who is an executive at Technicolor and had owned a studio in Fort Lee, New Jersey, before the movie industry decamped from Stinksville and <laughs> moved out here to slightly less Stinksville. <laughs> Listen to our episode, Monsters and the Nerds That Love Them, to find out more about both Lemley and Stinksville. They both decided along with every other brother duo in the country at the time that they could open up a movie studio of their own so they set out to do just that. Dupes. Dorks. Dorks. A duo of dorks. Duo of dorks. Irvin had gotten a four-picture deal with the Hodkinson Company, so his brother Carl arranged to build themselves a studio to make these four movies that turned out to be Down Home, Partners of the Tide, 50 Candles, and Face of the Wind. I love the sequel to 16 Candles, 50 Candles. <laughs> they didn't have as much money in the 80s, so they had to <laughs> cut back. The location they chose to put this studio was in Culver City at what is now the area around Washington, Hoke, and, you guessed it, Willett. <gasps> they cut the 
their own street. It's right next to the expo line. It was a small studio competing against the big boys and money was tight, so things had to be done efficiently. So one concept they had was of a building that would house their offices, but also would double as a dressing room and triple as a movie set. So the man they got to design such a building was Harry Oliver, an Oscar-nominated art director who had worked on some Harold Lloyd movies and also the original, original Ben-Hur, another Ben-Hur oh. man. Yeah. Ben- her man man women's rights everything's a female reboot it's suddenly it's been her what about ben him i want to end this podcast tonight <laughs> well that quit. might not be up to us <laughs> he also went on to design both the tam o'shantner oh, restaurant really? in oh. atwater village and also the original van de camp's bakery windmill really yeah so what he came up with came into existence with willett studio in the year 1921 and is what we now know simply as the witch house you might not have guessed it but this is because it looks like a witch house. <laughs> it had pointed, sloping roofs, shingles dyed to look like rotting cedar, slanted windows, shutters hung at weird angles. It was described as looking like a dilapidated gingerbread house. Yeah. It was a perfect set for any sort of European countryside Hansel and Gretel sort of movie. Yeah. More than that, it was actually in the design of a particular style that was just becoming popular at the time, storybook architecture. A del- Oh. The storybook was part of a greater architecture movement that had been going on called Period Revival, which included French Norman, Late Tudor Revival, Late Gothic Revival, Chateau-esque, and Storybook. These were being built all over the country, but it was nowhere near as popular anywhere else as it was in LA with Storybook in particular. Storybook madness started around 1919 thanks to the horrors of World War One, <laughs> From the people that brought you shell shock. <laughs> <laughs> from the people that brought you mustard gas and trench warfare <laughs> comes World War Two, <laughs> bigger, better, bloodier. Just when you thought you got over PTSD, World War Two. <laughs> Just when you thought it couldn't get any more racial, the- American soldiers had spent many traumatic months spilling blood all over the European countryside. But when they weren't looking through a target site or deep into their own black souls, they <laughs> they saw the quaint little cottages and the houses that scared civilians were hiding from them inside of. So and seeing these things must like have- a storybook. <laughs> it's just like I read when I was a little kid. Get the Molotov. Cottage. Cocktails. Seeing these things must have made them wish for quieter, cozier lives than what they were living, so the ones lucky enough to come home outside of a coffin decided that they wanted a piece of that comfort for themselves. So homes started being built to resemble these European cottages. Mm. The thing is, these style of houses in Europe were actually recreation of things from an even earlier, quainter time that had started being built around Europe as a backlash to the industrialization of the 1800s and a rejection of modern living. This is like a midnight of Paris of architecture. Yeah. <laughs> it was so much better. Better in World War One. <laughs> no, it was so much better in the Seven Year War. <laughs> Around this same. No, it was so much better when Genghis Khan was here. <laughs> Let's do that. Huts. <laughs> They're called yurts. <laughs> I'm leaving. Yeah. Yurts, don't it? Yurt gonna pay for that. <laughs> Around this same time, which is post-World War One, photo books of this architecture started being published for the first time, further fueling the style's popularity for those who weren't lucky enough to go over there to get trench foot. And to make these country dreams come true, around this time as well, the construction techniques required to make designs like this became cheap and affordable to do. This popularity was particularly felt in LA because of three things. First was the movie industry, which mm-hmm. provided not only the inspiration and creativity to think these things up, but also the craftsmen required to do the job. Yeah. These sorts of things were being made by art directors rather than architects. Movie set designers were great at making new, cheap things look old and sturdy, and they were willing to do the work for this. The second thing was that LA was going through a growth spurt at this time, and having these like charismatic styles of houses being built like this, rather than just bungalow fever. It made. <laughs> <laughs> Did you catch bungalow fever? <laughs> bungalow, how can you? How... Bungalow, how, bunga, how low can you bunga go? There we go. <laughs> Perfect. How low can you bungalow? How, <laughs> how low can you bungalow? <laughs> how low can you low? Oh no. I think I missed the thread of the joke. <laughs> I withdraw my pun. Instead of just bungalows, it made the extreme urban development more palatable to the eye and therefore it was more accepted by the public. The third thing was that the period revival style when applied to homes and apartments and public and private institutions, it gave whatever was in that building an air of glamour and sophistication and legitimacy. It wasn't just a new apartment building. It was two-door style luxury living. That isn't a university that was built yesterday. It's a hallowed gothic institution that was built yesterday. (laughs) By evoking the old world glamour of the actually old structures of the East Coast in Europe, LA could try to mask their self-consciousness that it still has today of being such a young city. It was like a perfect example of the tug of war between our la-la love of fantasy and being different, but also being like, well, we're legitimate and we want you to take us seriously also. Case in point, 
Elvira. <laughs> Case in point, the Venice Canal. <laughs> but the element of movie makers designing these homes added that extra layer to period revival that pushed it into the realm of storybook. Mm -hmm. They weren't trying to recreate logically or accurately the old European styles like the other period revivals were. They were building on a myth of like a cartoonish fantasy yeah. idea that people had of old Europe. Storybook was more whimsical than the other yeah. styles. They're asymmetrical, they're cozy, they're small, they usually have half rounded doors set in stone archways. They always have curved roofs with wooden shingles and irregular patterns. Yeah. There's, there's castle turrets, there's towers, there's a lot of ironwork. They were designed to look ramshackle and handmade on purpose. The yeah. rest of Period Revival was focused on authentic reproductions of the past. Storybook was more concerned with recreating a feeling and an emotional attachment with a specific time and place, like a fake New York street on the Universal Studios tour. Like that's it's not how it is, but you get the point. Yeah, you, yeah you, <laughs> this you, is the shorthand yeah. for it. In the background, it'll pass. <laughs> if the camera's out of focus, it'll look good. Yeah. Most of the storybook designs they were doing were actually historically impossible like that wouldn't be there yeah and putting these sorts of things in movies just perpetuated the myth that they themselves were building it was a much sillier style than the rest of period revival and it didn't take itself as seriously as they did the wish house does look like a house i've seen like silly symphonies it's it cartoony. looks like it's playing a song yeah exactly yeah <laughs> the house is dancing to the mighty Wurlitzer. <laughs> the silliness of this all it was a style element that was key and appealing key and appeal, appeal. <laughs> <laughs> it was key in appealing <laughs> to many of the film people who are moving out to LA at this time to escape the seriousness of the east coast like they just want like let's just yeah. let's just, just wear sandals surf. and have fun yeah. at this time style as salesmanship was key like googie and yeah. mimetic styles that would soon be in LA also yeah. fantasy meets reality and function they were described in advertisements with things like it's Hansel and Gretel style fairy tale hobbit mm -hmm. house Disney-esque the highest concentrations of storybook and period revival homes in LA are in areas developed in the 20s and 30s, like along Wilshire and Hollywood, Laurel Canyon, Los Feliz. The most famous area of storybook style and other period revival homes was the Hollywood Land Development, built in 1923. Really? Whitley, whatever? Who's that? I'm talking about the Ben Affleck movie. Nah. Since all the homes there were in this style in the Hollywood land development, this mm -hmm. was the first theme residential community in the country. I see. Hear more about that in our landmark episode. <laughs> Classic. Some other storybook examples around town are another witch type house in Los Feliz built in 1923 inspired by the Tam O'Shanter Inn that Leonardo DiCaprio was going to buy for his parents in the 90s, but is now inhabited by something even worse than witches or DiCaprio's Two librarians. Ugh. Yeah. What are they reading in there? Story Kill the witches. <laughs> There's also the Charlie Chaplin Cottages, built in 1923 oh, yeah, at yeah. 1330 North Formosa Avenue. Not his studio. That's oh, that's a different side. Else. These are like weird. They're nearby, but it's By just, Marshall? It's yeah. just like in an it's like house, 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 uh wacky, wacky, fun, fun, house, house, house. Right, right. Okay. And these were the living spaces for the actors working at his studio, like Judy Garland, okay. Rudolph Valentino, John Barrymore, Chaplin himself, and Douglas Fairbanks. One can only assume Mary Pickford shacked up there for the ride. They're now apartments and they're apparently very haunted. There's the Snow White Cottages on the 2900 block of Griffith Park Boulevard that were built in 1931. There are eight cottages that housed animators at the original Disney Studios, which was nearby. I think I I think that's, been the one, there. that's the one by Marshall, isn't it? Uh, Marshall High School. I'm about to say what it is and it'll make sense to you. At least one animator who worked on Snow White lived there, which is why it's believed to have been the inspiration for the look of the dwarves cottages oh, okay. in Snow White. Yeah. Elliot Smith lived there in number 2906 and it was used in Mulholland Drive. Oh, that's those, the one, yeah. Those ones. Yeah, okay, that's taken me there before okay yeah i have what is this, this is david lynch film it's by marshall high school yeah. <laughs> we are marshall <laughs> there's the hobbit house at 3819 dunn drive in culver city mm -hmm. but this one was built much later between 1946 and 1970 by yeah. another disney artist oh, really? it took a really long time to build well hobbits have little hands <laughs> they don't build with big feet. feet little hands you know what they say about hobbits with big feet they build slow houses <laughs> um lazy <laughs> Lazy like Samwise Gamgee and his dad. Gomez Adams. Gomez Adams. <laughs> Father of the Hobbits, Gomez Adams. <laughs> it's a real, like I looked at it on Google Maps. That's a, I would love to live there. Yeah. It looks really cozy. I read like interviews of like about that house and like people who's like, yeah, our friends live there. We go to visit and it's like a vacation every time. Oh like it's God. so nice to yeah, be there. A Disney artist named Joseph Lawrence who built that one. The Hloffer 
Corisier residence on right. Glendower Avenue, built in 1923, is one of three storybook places that are LA historic landmarks. Uh-huh. So is the Einar C. Peterson Studio Court in Koreatown, built in 1921. It's a little village of homes built by Einar C. Peterson, who is a Danish artist, and was the look of it was based on his hometown in Abeltoft. These homes actually predate the original witch house, so Peterson is considered the pioneer of this style in LA, yeah. but they're not as weird and wild. Weird and wild, wild as the other designs like it's sort of like a tame version of storybook okay he also did some murals at clifton's which are no longer there they replaced it with six bars (laughs) they had to make room for a uh tiki hut or something Wow, solid bird. Yeah. Well, you watch out, Clifton. <laughs> Take note. We're shooting for the knees. <laughs> there are also several pub-style restaurants done in the storybook fashion. These types of buildings were hard to produce on a mass scale, so they were never that widespread. But what we're around gave LA a spirit of creativity, and then the depression hit. <laughs> And Storybook got even more popular. People (gasps) wanted more than ever to turn away from reality and live in a fantasy shack. So more Storybook houses started being built. But by this point, they were Storybook only by name. Like the whimsy and the extravagance were toned down. Make it look like it was cheaply made. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Everything looks like that now. (laughs) It was all toned down because it it was a depression. Have a little respect. But then World War II hit and artistic liberty had to be melted down into bullets. (laughs) So the sequel to the war that started the trend ended up killing it. There just weren't enough resources sources anymore to build wacky houses and then post world war ii everything was mass production cookie cutter so that's yeah. the opposite of everything that storybook stands for yeah in the late 40s kenneth warthen designed the last dying batch of storybook cottages called the fantasy cottage thematic district there were a few of these near a few different movie studios in toluca lake hollywood north hollywood and the last one in studio city but by 1950s storybook style was dead and it lived happily ever after because <laughs> uh, it was dead and that's the only happy ending it's weird there is no afterlife. There, there is no God. <laughs> it's weird that they're all like actor housing for the studios. Yeah, mm. is that weird? Because it was a town that basically only we only wanted actors and industry people for a while. Yeah. All these people <laughs> cooking <laughs> rice. I don't know. This guy's a paint sign for the movies. We do like taxes for like who? Rock Hudson? We plumber to the stars. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> but now that you know the entire story, let's go back to the house that we were actually talking oh, about. Please, yeah. The Witch House. Cut to Willett Studios. 1921. Very spooky year. The house was right at the front of the studio on the street and it was so strange it became a sort of local landmark and apparently caused many accidents from drivers that were staring (laughs) at it. It's the house that launched the whole storybook trend in LA and is also suspected by many to have been an influence for a lot of the buildings that were built later on in Disneyland. The first movie it's believed to have been in was The Faces of the World in 1921 which is one of Irvin's four movies but was also probably in the background of a few other silent movies we uh, just look at. Watch every silent movie you'll see it. (laughs) But come 1924 Irvin signed a deal to direct Paramount Mount's first Technicolor movie, Wanderer of the Wasteland, and then signed on to make even more movies at Paramount, and by 1926, the Willett studio was shutting down. The Witch House was going to be demolished, but a movie producer named Ward LaSalle was so in love with it that he bought it from them and moved it moved it to I a plot it. of the witchcraft, to a plot of land that he owned at 516 North Walden Drive in Beverly Hills at the northeast corner of Walden and Carmelita, where he converted it into a livable but small house made up of entry hall, bedroom, bathroom and a tiny kitchen. He would have been glad to live there his whole life, but his wife, Lillian, did not want him. What a She was not very glad about that. She divorced him. He was kicked out. Lillian remained in the house and remarried their old manservant, Mr. Spadina. I guess she did like the house. I guess she found out what was wrong. This place is too small for two people. Mr. Spadina, and that's why the house is now officially known as the Spadina House. Okay. It's named after the manservant. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, (laughs) this was before Vampira cracked open the glass ceiling (laughs) for everybody. Lillian and Spadina lived there until 1965 when it was sold to the Green family who finally saw the potential of this house and turned it into one of the best Halloween spots in the city. Throughout the 70s and 80s on Halloween, they would fill the moat there's a moat there's a moat around the house with dry ice and they would play the haunted mansion music out of the top windows and thousands of kids would come to get candy from Mrs. Green who would dress up like a witch which is believed to be when people started calling it the witch house, house yeah. it was a local icon for kids in the know on Halloween but one year they just stopped like it just ended there was no explanation they were they just weren't decorated and no one was there to give out candy trick or treat smell my feet give me something good to eat you did not you will <laughs> suffer by the 90s the house was in serious disrepair and in 19 
1997, Mrs. Green felt that it was time to sell it, but she was still very protective of the house. She would only show it to buyers who brought cashier's checks for the deposit with them, but she found that all the buyers, they were just interested in the land. They were just going to tear it down and build a huge thing on top of it, which she could not stand to let happen. But at that time, nobody was interested in a house that looked like that. So there was nobody to sell it to. Like nobody was going to just live in that thing. There was even talk at one point of moving it back to Culver City as a museum. But what about the man she had hired to sell the house himself? Michael J. Fox. (gasps) Michael J. Lebo was her real estate agent from Coldwell Banker. He's a local boy, grew up in Beverly Hills, went to Beverly Hills High, went to UCLA. As a kid, he would always go trick-or-treating at the witch house. And he started doing real estate in Cheviot Hills, where there were a lot of storybook style houses. And he fell in love with that. And like Mrs. Green, he couldn't bear to have somebody just buy the witch house just to tear it down. And he had the money. So in July 1998, he bought it for himself for $1.3 million, making him the third resident of the house. Unfortunately, the inside of the house was a Offensively 1960s. Ah. The Greens had completely redone the interior to fit their very groovy needs. It was all tile and shag carpet with cottage cheese ceilings and everything was a lava lamp. It was Munsters on the outside, but Brady Bunch on the inside. (laughs) The fireplace is a lava lamp. (laughs) That's a lava place. The oven, lava lamp. We only cook lava. The lava's ready. Again, (laughs) can't I just do cocaine? (laughs) He decided he was going to remodel the house to look like a normal American 90s home, but then he met an art director named Nelson Coates, who saw that Lebo had the opportunity to do something really interesting here. So to Together, they embarked on a five-year renovation of the house. And when the construction fences went up around the house, the whole neighborhood freaked out because they thought they were about to tear it down. So yeah. we started getting a lot of hate mail. But once the construction was done, they all had to rescind their death threats because <laughs> what he did was really incredible. He expanded the house to 3,500 square feet, but maintained everything about the outside and even added to it. All the witchiness was intact. And now there was also, there, like he put like twisted gnarled trees and wow. shrubs in the garden. He put a ceramic bottom on the moat, put a bridge going over it as the 90s demanded he raised the roof in many places <laughs> and he added a skylight there's an iron spider web on the door wow. there's a little witch on the address marking on the curb there's a warped wooden picket fence with signs on it that say no trespassing in red ink there's all sorts of little things all over the place that's, uh, that's, yeah, there's like signs from the witch saying not to eat their fruit and things like that that's like real love <laughs> yeah that's a real yeah, love there. he put in a lagoon as for the inside he made it match the feel perfectly at the outside it's, yeah. there's pictures but it's described as like being in Mr. Toad's wild ride That's when you're cool. inside there. Yeah. Uh, hell. It's hot and crowded. <laughs> hot and my glasses fog up. <laughs> the witch house was in Clueless briefly. Oh, yeah. And in 1965, The Loved One and 1957's The Undead. It's the most renowned example of storybook architecture in LA and maybe even the entire country. In 2013, it became a Beverly Hills historic landmark. It's also the most visited and most requested non-celebrity house on tours in West LA. Tour buses are constantly going by every day to see it, but you can just drive up. We'll, we'll charge you, but we could take you up there if you want to see it. And Lebo, he loves living there. Like, he's the perfect owner for it. And, of course, he goes all out on Halloween, and kids know that. It's on par with Angelino Heights, it seems, with how many kids show up. In 2014, around 4,000 came begging for Milky Ways from this poor man. (laughs) One year, he was worried that it was a nuisance to his neighbors. So, out of respect for them, he decided not to do anything. So, he put ads in the paper, like, don't come. I'm not doing it this year. And he kept the lights out. But thousands of kids still showed up. So, he figured, (laughs) just just do it. Like, this is what... This is your job. Yeah. Like you have to do this, and he likes doing it. Like yeah, he I would he, too. he hires private security to keep an eye on things because it's just such an overwhelming number of people that show up. The LAPD and volunteers are also there to try to maintain order. They close the streets wow. of traffic. So to all of our children listeners whose parents don't want to take them trick or treating, we will take you there if we get a hundred percent of your earnings. Yeah, no, you get taxed heavily by yeah. us. Yeah. Also, give us your parents' credit cards. Now I want to drive there right now. I know. I want to see it, and I and I'm asking for candy. <laughs> I know it's the end of September, but but like, mm, I want candy. I I want appetizers right now. (laughs) I want Snickers appetizers. It's incredible. Perfect Uh, guy for the job. A lot of love in this episode. Love of orgies. Love of official titles from Los Angeles. Love of virility horns. (laughs) Just a few sort of witchy sort of things in LA. Spooky. Spooky. I am frightened. I wet myself repeatedly during this episode. (laughs) And I just sat in it, enthralled by the stories. LA is a spooky place. Not Mm -hmm. just because of hauntings, but because there is some weird actual (laughs) Halloween culture But because of empowered women. Because of empowered women. Yeah, like this last year's thing about 
about Angelino Heights. Listen to Angelino Frights if you want to hear about that. And yeah. this year is like the Witch House and the Horror Host. Like there's there's such a strong Halloween culture, like trick yeah. or treating culture. Yeah. That I feel like isn't in. You know, it's not in a place like New York or San Francisco no. as much. Because like I want to suburbia. Once again, blame like the movies because mm-hmm. Angelino Heights was used in several movies. Yeah. My two always this blaming year, the movies. Always blaming the movies. Uh, my two were actresses that were here that yeah. made their big break by doing horror host Witch stuff. House is in Witch movies. Witch House is in movies. <laughs> so uh, was Louis Hubner. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it, the movies draw us that sort of thing because horror movies are really big, but we're yeah. happy to have these things here that are part of our... Uh, I'm not. I think it's a front to Christianity. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I mean, I just think these things are unholy and that we shouldn't be talking about them this late at night. It's close to the witching hour. <laughs> Eep, up, work, ah, ah. Ting, tang, walla, walla, bing, bang. <laughs> ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, tang, walla, walla. Mm, bing, bing. Leave a review on iTunes. They're always useful. They're always helpful. Thank you very much for whoever's done it recently. Thank yeah, you for star it. ratings. Thank if, you very much. Again, if you have an iPhone, just click on your podcast app, search for LA Meekly. Just press five stars. It's that easy. It helps us out a lot. Ooh. Give us a star rating you think we deserve. That's a better one. Why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> don't even, don't <laughs> tell these people don't know that you can leave one star. <laughs> yeah, it helps us out a lot. It yeah. gets us noticed by more people. It makes us easier to find. Yeah. Follow us on Twitter at LA Meekly. Follow us on Instagram, LA underscore Meekly. We post every day. Like um, us on Facebook. We post uh, articles about things and things uh, and things. We have a home base, lameekly.tumblr.com, which mm-hmm. is uh, we post our episodes. We have a podcast pictures. archive there, episode archive, I mean. We have pictures every day. You can email us, la.meekly at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. If you have any ideas, we are our field trip episode should be coming out soon yeah i know we just have to make a theme song i'm yeah, sorry it's so close if you want the episode I ju- i'm trying to get eric clapton <laughs> to record our new theme song but he won't do it he says he won't sing tears in heaven anymore i, well, I mean what's what's the big deal i mean i met him down at the crossroads i said we need a theme song and he said get out of here you're not the devil i said you don't know that he thinks i'm trying to steal patty boyd <laughs> who's a witch yeah and also we are going me and daniel will be on a toast battle on october 17th at it's a comedy thing it's the opposite of a roast battle me and daniel are going to compliment each which other which is also a comedy thing yes which is also a comedy thing at a bar Schoonerville with Bar and Grill in Canoga Park you might also see us at the uh, Archives Bazaar at USC we might be uh, walking around maybe not might be we will be we'll be wearing badges yeah come we'll- see us we might be handing out stickers we might not we may depending on the price i mean yeah come, come on. on i want to find something cheap if you know cheap sticker prices for <laughs> rectangular stickers please let us know yeah. what a plea for help i know well, we're two children what do you want <laughs> also if you know how to tie shoes we've been my god it's my nose is bruised like you wouldn't believe i, I will not wear sandals <laughs> i don't care how much i, I, I don't know how to tie those if you have any ideas for we're doing field trip episodes as well if you contact us want to talk to us about somewhere you work or someone you have access to or you just want to talk to us let us know <laughs> if you just need someone to talk to yeah, let us know we we'll, are we'll pawn you off to someone we're qualified we also will be coming up on an episode of this is rad well that's right soon, we talking will, about the twilight zone um, yeah we will keep you updated on that yes uh, well, we have a lot of stuff coming up we do oh yeah and we're also being elected president oh is that coming up this is all a sham we're the actual president yeah yeah no they're just having fun i'd like to thank the Clatsop County Historical Society for giving me some information on Vampira and Myla Nermi. She grew up in Astoria, Oregon. They have a quarterly magazine called Come Tux and they, they sent me an issue of that and it's very helpful. So thank you to them. Yeah, I bet it was. Please watch all the Vampira stuff and the Elvira stuff on YouTube. It's so much fun. You'll yeah. enjoy all of October if you do that. Also, have a nice Halloween. Oh yeah, have a nice Halloween. Uh, let's Maybe we'll see you at the Witch's House this year. Send, you know what, tweet us pictures of you yeah. trick-or-treating at these places. Yeah, Angelina uh, Heights. This is going under the assumption that all of our listeners are eight. Listen, I'm okay with that if you're eight i bet you are i tom jones there's some episodes that you shouldn't listen to kids okay you're not ready for it five minutes this was not you were not ready for that (laughs) none of us were yeah have a nice halloween eat you know everything that's already been unwrapped if you yeah. think that there's some sort of like needle puncture in something go ahead eat it yeah if you see like it's a shiny fine. thing in an apple go, just go for it it's fine <laughs> shiny things are good what's the last bad thing that's been shiny <laughs> think of something if it's rusty then you don't want to eat it this I, is clean you, know, yeah. you don't want to get tetanus yeah you disinfect it for just douse it in some bleach and then yeah. eat it yeah if you see something say shiny something. if you see something say something <laughs> and that say something will be that has been another yet another spooky episode of la meekly listing our favorite foods from the 50s since 2013 the, the most haunted man. of years <laughs> 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 See you in November. 